Final Fantasy VII is my fourth or fifth favourite Final Fantasy game. I'm probably biased since I played 8 and 9 first, but regardless, I recognise this game to be as great as everyone always says it is. The materia system is always touted as one of the best things that Square has ever come up with, but I think the limit break system isn't getting the love that it deserves. You can't spam them like in FF8, and you can conserve them from one battle to the next, unlike FF9. I honestly feel like the limit system took a step back in 8 and 9 after 7 did it so well, but just how reliable are limits in this game? Can you beat Final Fantasy 7 with only limits? Let's find out. Here are the rules, but first. If you like challenge run videos, mostly for classic PlayStation games, then you're on the right channel. We're called NG+, and this is pretty much all we do here. If that's your thing, please subscribe, thank you. Back to the rules. Rule number one, we can only use limits in battle. The only exception to this are commands that don't damage or hinder enemies, like defending or stealing. Rule number two, no slots. Anyone who's played this game before will know that there is a limit called slots slots, and once acquired, it can be manipulated to instantly win any battle in the entire game, so we will not be allowing that. Rule number three, no items in battle. Using items outside of battle is fine though. Rule number four, no boosters that aid us in battle. The only booster we're allowed to use in this run is speed up. And finally, rule number five, once we defeat the final boss of the game, Sephiroth, we win? Also, we're playing the PS4 version of this game since they've fixed a few bugs compared to the original. Just to confirm, this means that we cannot use any magic, summons, enemy skills, etc. We can't even use our normal attack commands in battle. In fact, we won't even be using healing magic outside of battle either. Right away, we're forced into a battle against two armed guards. We only have one character at the start of the game, so all we can do is stand there and let them hit us. Our limit bar fills up upon taking damage. The more damage we take, the more the bar fills. There's no RNG to it unlike Final Fantasy IX. There are other factors that influence how much the bar fills up though, but we'll cover those when they become relevant. These guards have two attacks, machine gun and melee attack. The melee attack does a bit more damage for some reason, so that will fill our limit bar faster. Eventually we get to use our limit attack. The only one we have by default is Braver. This one shots one of the guards, but this also depletes our limit bar, so now we need to fill it up all over again. This means taking more damage, and the first time I tried this, we died before the limit bar could fill up again. Spoiler alert, we had to watch the opening cutscene a lot. We need to take a closer look at our situation. We'll never completely fill our limit bar twice in this one battle without healing, but fortunately, the game starts us off with almost half of our limit bar already filled. Without that, this would be impossible. We still need to optimise things as best we can though. For example, any damage we take whilst our limit bar is already full is a waste. If RNG is on our side, the two guards will attack us back to back, and the second hit will be what tops our limit bar up instead of the first hit. Predicting when our limit bar will be full isn't always easy since it is random whether the guards hit us with the machine gun or the melee attack. The two biggest mistakes we can make in this fight is either changing to the back row or defending. Doing either of these will result in less damage and doing both will result in taking even less damage. The reason it's a mistake in this fight is that the machine gun attacks will only deal one point of damage if we are both defending and in the back row. And with the formula that the game uses to calculate how much our limit bars increase, taking one damage will not fill it up at all. With good RNG, it is possible to win this fight, and the first time we won, we only had 7 HP remaining. How fitting. We can use potions to heal back up after this battle. The game starts us off with 3 potions, and we can find 2 more potions by searching the unconscious bodies on the ground. We name Cloud, Clued, and Barret, Bort. Don't ask. And as we make our way through the reactor, we can run into wild encounters. But this time, we're able to run away to conserve HP. On the way, we find a phoenix down and one more potion. We also get the restore materia right before the first boss fight. But the game doesn't allow you to change materia yet, so that's weird. We've banned healing magic anyway. We used our remaining potions to make sure both Clued and Bort were as healed as they could be before the guard scorpion. We even used random encounters to fill both our limit bars ahead of the battle. 
Right away, we used both limits back to back before the Guard Scorpion could even get a turn. Now for the bad news. We have dealt just over a quarter of the damage we need to beat the Guard Scorpion. We would need to hit another five limits minimum to win this fight. That is seven limits in total. How fitting. Doing that before it kills us seems like an impossible task. On our first attempt, we only hit four limits before we died. The Guard Scorpion simply hits too hard. And whereas taking more damage which fills our limit bars quicker, that's no good if we can't survive. It's actually possible for limits to get critical hits if we're very lucky, and that will deal roughly double damage. But the odds of dealing multiple critical hits in a row is astronomically low. Even if we allowed items in battle just for this one fight, we ran out of potions by the time we even reached the Guard Scorpion anyway. It is possible to get some potion drops from random encounters, but we can't rely on that either, as the damage we take from those random encounters just to win a single potion isn't worth it. We also can't grind out experience points for the same reason. With all that in mind, we decided that just for this one fight, we will allow items in battle. I feel the fight will still be interesting though, because we will be limited to only the items that we start the game with, and the items that we can find in the reactor itself. But since we already used all our potions already, we'll have to start the game again and conserve them better this time. As we said, we already start with three potions and we find find two more after getting off the train, and then one more before the boss fight for a total of six. However, if we're lucky, we can get a potion drop from the very first fight against the two guards, which means we can have seven potions to work with. How fitting. It's not just enough to rely on those potions though. It's time to get technical. There's something else we want to look out for. When Clued wins the first fight against the two guards, he will level up every time. The stat boost that Clued gets on this level up can vary with RNG. We can check Clued's stats after winning this battle and check how much strength he has. If he has 19 strength, then we're good. If it's any lower, we need to restart the run. Not to mention that we still need that potion drop too. Getting 19 strength from the first level up and the potion drop in the same run meant a lot of trial and error. I told you I've watched the opening cutscene a lot. But finally, the stars aligned, we won the fight against the guards, got the potion drop, and Clued was on 19 strength after the first level up. Now, Clued has very low HP after that fight, and previously we would have just used a potion or two to help him stay alive before joining up with Bord. However, we want to make sure we were as optimal as possible with our healing. We decided that we should get Bort in our party first before healing Clued. This means travelling across a couple of screens with a very weak Clued. Someone in our live chat suggested walking as that might reduce the encounter rate. I have no idea if it works, but we tried it anyway. We got one encounter, but thankfully we were able to run away before dying. Bort has now joined the party, and we travel through the reactor as normal. When we run into our next random encounter, we actually want Clued to go down before running away. Once we reach the save point before the Guard Scorpion, we use a Phoenix Down on Clued. This revives him with a quarter of his HP restored. Now, Clued has 79 HP instead of 10, so using two potions now puts Clued on 279 HP instead of the 210 HP he would have had if we hadn't let Clued go down. Every little helps. This leaves us with five potions remaining. Now, for the Guard Scorpion fight itself. We went straight in without filling our limit bars, since it was likely it wouldn't change much overall, Bort starts the fight with half of his limit bar already filled, and he gets hit straight away by its strongest attack, Scorpion Tail. This gets Bort very close to filling his limit. In this situation, we want to quickly put Bort in the back row, and on his next turn, we can even have him defend himself too. The reason for this is to reduce the damage that Bort receives the next time he gets hit. Since his limit bar is so close to being full anyway, the next hit he takes may as well be reduced as much much as possible. The fact that Guard Scorpion uses Search Scope every other turn buys us the time we need to both change row and defend before getting hit again. A single attack on Bort will top his limit bar up regardless, since even the Guard Scorpion's weakest attack, Rifle, deals 8 points of damage. This allows Bort to hit a big shot for 111 damage. The Guard Scorpion has 800 HP in total, so 689 left to go. We use the time that the Guard Scorpion takes to raise its tail to put Bort back in the front row. This means he takes more damage again, but it speeds up the rate his limit bar increases too. Taking any action after defending will stop that character from defending themselves, and this includes changing rows. Clue takes a few hits, so he hits back with a Braver for 119 damage. Guard Scorpion raises its tail once again, and we take the time
time to use a potion on Clued. Bort's limit gets really close again, so we use the usual method of moving him to the back row and having him defend himself. It pays off again as he only takes 8 damage from a rifle and he gets his limit ready too. That's another 109 damage. We use a second potion on Bort to heal him to 204 HP. This should be just enough for him to get one more limit in before he goes down. Both Clued and Bort's limits are nearly full so they both move to the back row and defend. Clued uses a third potion on himself at this point too. A scorpion tail brings Bort down to low HP, but he's able to get off a big shot for 112 damage. We only have two potions left, and if we use one on Bort now, there's no guarantee he would get another limit before dying. Plus, Clued's limit is dealing slightly more damage anyway, so we decide to let Bort go down. Another scorpion tail gives Clued his limit, and he hits a braver for 117 damage. It's worth noting that damage from limits is not reduced from being in the back row. Now, the plan is to tank hits in the front row and use our last two remaining potions as and when needed. Healing back to full HP right away would be a mistake as we want to optimize our healing as much as possible. As always, we change to the back row and defend ourselves when the limit bar is close to max. This allows us to hit another Braver for 123 damage. Then Clue takes a Scorpion Tail which lowers him down to 29 HP. We use our final potion, but another Scorpion Tail drops our HP down to 65. That just so happens to be about the amount of damage a single scorpion tail can deal. So that goes to show the importance of changing to the back row and defending. We just survive another scorpion tail and now we can pull off the final braver. Since the guard scorpion had taken 691 damage, 123 damage was enough to beat it by just 14 HP. We equip Bort with his new weapon and take a nice stroll out of the reactor before it blows up. Before we leave though, make a backup save file here. You'll see why later. We run from all random encounters on the way out. We could lower the battle speed in the settings to make running away from fights easier, but we decided to keep the battle speed on default throughout the run. You can also avoid all battles against the guards outside before jumping on the train. Once we arrive in Sector 7, we give Tifa her name, Tofu, and Bork gives us 1,500 gil. Now that we have access to the Materia menu, we can see that Clued has Lightning and Ice Materia by default. We want to take them both off. We can't use them anyway, so all all they're doing is lowering Cloud's max HP. We also grab the All Materia, an Aether, and buy three Iron Bangles before we leave. The All Materia doesn't affect our stats, so we may as well equip it. It may seem useless, but it will be a big help later. We're supposed to get on a train now to start our next mission. However, there's something important we need to do first. We need to unlock Bort's level 2 limit. Most characters have four limit levels, and they learn two limits for the first three levels, and then one limit for the final fourth level. We'll mention level four limits later in the video. Characters will start with their first level one limit already learned by default. And to learn their second level one limit, they need to use their first level one limit a set number of times. In Bort's case, he needs to use Big Shot nine times in total to learn Mind Blow. There's an area to the right of the train where we can farm random encounters, and we can use these to help us use Big Shot six more times and learn Mind Blow. Now, to learn a level two limit, it's not about using a limit a number of times in battle, it's all about getting kills. Each character must get a set number of total kills before they can learn the first limit of a new level, and for Bort, he must get a total of 80 kills. We need to farm 80 kills for Bort before we get on the train. Bort has to be the one to land the final blow for these kills to count for him. Couple that with the fact that he can only attack with big shots since Mind Blow only does MP damage, and this takes a long time. Thank goodness for times 3 speed up. Also, we don't need to worry about healing during this grind as we can rest in Sector 7 for less kill than we're earning from the battles. Something else we need to be mindful of though, we don't want to be over leveled in this run. The more HP we have early on, the harder it's going to be to fill our limit bars in battle. An option we have to avoid excessive leveling, we can have Bort kill an enemy or two and then flee the battle to avoid getting experience points entirely. The kills will still count this way. During this grind, Mind, Clued learns Cross Slash after using Braver a total of 8 times, and Tofu learns Somersault after using Beach Rush 9 times. Eventually, after reaching levels 9 to 10, we get 80 kills with Bort and unlock his first level 2 limit, Grenade Bomb. 
You'll see why we need this soon. We set Bort to his second limit level, and also we filled up all three characters' limit bars in preparation for the next part of the run. That grinding session also earned us quite a few potions and ethers. We play on as normal and grab all the items in the second reactor. We flee all random encounters as we want to conserve our limits. Soon we face the second boss, Airbuster. This fight is an automatic pincer attack in our favour. We can use Tofu's limit straight away for a total of 494 damage. Normally, if you land an attack on the enemy's back in battle, you deal double damage, but the Airbuster is a unique case. Back attacks against this boss deal 5 times normal damage. Since Tofu hit Airbuster first, it turns towards her to counterattack. This means Clued can land a back attack now, and his cross slash deals 740 damage. That was enough to two-shot the Airbuster, which earns us the Titan Bangle. It was important that we didn't use Bort's limit in that fight. We need to keep it. Clued is separated from the other two, and he now teams up with a new ally, and we gave her the name Airlift. We're being chased by guards through the church. Airlift slips down to the bottom floor and we need to make sure that she doesn't get into any battles whatsoever. Otherwise, we're softlocked. The reason being, Airlift's limit can only heal. So she can never deal any damage. And she can't flee the guards once the fight is initiated. We can have Clued drop barrels down from the rafters to land on the guards to avoid all battle. We need to top all the barrels in the correct order though. The order is top left, top right, and bottom right. The last barrel can be ignored. We flee to the slums where we can purchase more Titan Bangles and find our first Turtle Paradise poster. Outside Airlift's house, we grab the cover materia and an ether. Before long, we're heading into Sector 6. We can put the cover materia on Airlift. This gives her a 20% chance of jumping in front of physical attacks that are directed at other party members. This will ensure that Airlift takes more hits and thus boosts her limit bar faster. This will help a lot throughout the entire run as airlift's limit healing wind will restore exactly half of each party member's max hp this is now our only method of healing in battle this battle against a hell house was also the first time we saw a limit get a critical hit once we're in sector six we finally have access to hypers in the item shop we're going to always want a supply of hypers on hand throughout the entire run using a hyper on a party member will inflict them with the fury status this doubles the rate that their limit bars fill up upon taking damage. The downside to Fury is that it lowers the party member's accuracy, but limits are not affected by accuracy anyway, so in this run there is no downside to being Furied. We buy some mithril armlets and a new weapon for Tofu, but we don't bother buying Airlift's new weapon as she can't make use of the extra attack power anyway. As for Don Corneo's mansion, we want to ensure that the Don chooses Clued once we get inside. This means asking for a soft and shimmery dress, winning the squats minigame, getting a voucher from eating at the diner, trading that voucher for a digestive, giving that digestive to the woman in the toilet, buying the most expensive item in the vending machine, and getting the bikini from the honeybee in. We can also get our makeup done, but it's RNG on how much that actually helps. Before we put our disguise on, we want to leave the area and use a random encounter to fill our limit bars. This is the last chance we get at doing this, since we can't leave the area in a dress. We grab an ether inside the mansion and reunite with Tofu. We need to do some setup for the upcoming boss fight. We equip Tofu's new weapon and then put her in the middle of the party. That may seem pointless, but you'll see why. We also want Clued in the back row and both Tofu and Airlift in the front row. Making sure that Clued is the chosen one by the Don skips a couple of battles against Don's goons. We grab the Hyper hidden behind Don's bed and we get dropped into the sewers. If we bought Hypers from the shop earlier like we should have, we would have used one on Clued and Airlift at least. If you're like me and you forgot to buy them, then the one we found behind the bed is the only one we'll have. In our case, we use that one hyper on airlift for more regular healing. Now we're up against the next boss. It starts off using Tsunami, which hurts itself as well as the party members. Clued already has a Cross Slash ready, and Cross Slash can also paralyze the target temporarily. This will be handy going forward in case we ever need an extra turn to defend ourselves. Apps also has a Lick Attack that causes Sadness on the target. Sadness is basically the opposite of Fury. Anyone affected by it will take 30% less damage overall, but their limit bars will increase at half their normal rate. Fortunately, Apps will only ever use 
stick on the party member in the middle, as long as that party member is alive. We chose Tofu as our scapegoat for this, as Clued hits harder anyway and airlift heals. You can tell when someone has either Fury or Sadness, as their limit bars will turn red or blue respectively. Also, if any party members are in the back row, then they are the only party members that the apps would attack physically. Since Clued is the only one in the back row, he's the only one getting targeted by physical attacks. This means that Tofu will take all the licks, Clued will take all the normal hits, and Airlift will cover Clued now and then. This setup ensures both survivability and consistent damage throughout the battle. Even Tofu gets her limit after a while despite her sadness. If Clued's HP starts to fall too much, we can quickly put him in the front row and then move Airlift to the back row. Now all physical damage will be directed to Airlift instead, which, before long, results in a healing win. Keep this up for a while and it isn't long before Apps goes down. Following that battle, we can find a potion and the steel materia. We can use the steel materia right away on the Sahagin enemies to steal hypers, just in case you don't have any for some reason. We debated whether we would be allowed to use the steel materia, and since it doesn't cause any damage, we decided to allow it. If we ever upgraded it to Mug, then it would be a problem since Mug deals damage. We took the time to steal the striking staff for airlift in the train graveyard. The extra attack may be useless, but the extra materia slots might be helpful. We also made sure Clued and Tifa had their limits ready before we left. When we arrive in Sector 7, Airlift leaves the party. Before we head up the tower, we can buy items from the NPC below. And if you didn't already, now is the time to load up on Hypers. We use Hypers to get both Clued and Tofu in Fury status. Since Tofu has Sadness already, she needed two Hypers, one to remove the Sadness and a second one to add Fury. We flee all encounters on the way up the tower and reunite with Bort. We get a chance to access the menu one last time before the next boss, so we use a Hyper on Bort and potions to fully heal us. We also put the cover materia on Bort. All three party members should have their limits ready to go as well, since we saved Bort's from the previous boss fight. The next boss is Reno, and his main gimmick is that he traps party members inside pyramids, which renders that character useless until they're freed. The only way to free a party member trapped inside a pyramid is to attack the pyramid, but of course, we can only do this with limits. Since the pyramids count as enemy targets, AoE limits will hit both Reno and and the pyramids. This is exactly why we took the time to learn Grenade Bomb early. We follow up with both Tofu and Clued's limits. Here's where things get dangerous. If Reno uses Pyramid on all three party members at the same time, it counts as a game over, and if we don't have any limits ready to go, there's nothing we can do about it. Clued gets trapped again, and then Reno gets a critical hit on Tofu. This fills her limit bar straight away. Since we learned Tofu's second limit, her limit can hit twice, as long as we don't land on a miss in the slots. And she targets the enemies in turn, so her first attack from her limit will hit Reno and the second one breaks the pyramid. Tofu gets trapped next, however, Bort takes a hit for Clued thanks to the cover materia and gets his limit, so a grenade bomb soon frees Tofu. This pattern continued for a while, in fact, Reno never used pyramid on Bort at all. Maybe we were just lucky. Bort got dropped to 13 HP, but he got off one final grenade bomb to win the fight. First try by the way, we grab the sense materia and rest in Sector 6. Resting at inns also removes our Fury status, as the game considers them to be a negative status. After climbing our way to Shimra HQ, we have two choices, the front door or the stairs. We'd rather fewer battles, so we'll be taking the stairs. We made sure all three party members had Fury ready for the forced battle against three guards at the top. Our limit bars filling at double the amount makes this fight easy. When we come to the password puzzle, we need to make sure we nail it first try for the elemental material. Materia. This will almost be essential to this run. We equip the elemental materia just to get some AP on it as we go. We also get all three rewards from the door puzzle room too, the most important one being Star Pendant. On the next floor up, we can rest to recover our HP, but that also means having to use three more hypers again to reapply Fury. However, we discovered that using a tent at save points fully heals the party, but doesn't remove Fury. We grab all the items from the lockers, fix the Midgar model, and take the the elevator to the bottom floor to find the second Turtle Paradise poster. Also, we got Pincer attacked at one point, and in this run, this is one of the scariest situations to be in. Until one side of enemies are defeated, we can't flee the battle, so if we get pincered when our limit bars are all low, we could be in big trouble. Not to mention that if an enemy hits us from behind, they deal 
double damage. Thankfully, we were able to win this pincer attack. In the next battle, we were able to steal the hard edge for Clued, and after that same battle, Bort learned Hammer Blow by using Grenade Bomb eight times in total. Before the next boss, we make sure Clued and Bort have Fury, and we equip Clued with the Star Pendant to make him immune to poison. We ask Tofu to take care of Airlift. We name Red 13, Rod 34, and we're up against our next boss, the Sample. We didn't have a chance to use a Hyper on Rod before this battle, so we'll have to make do. The sample starts off with Shady Breath to poison all party members, but Clued's star pendant protects him from the effect. Clued gets hit with an ice spell by one of the three smaller monsters, but this gave him his limit. With his new hard edge sword, a cross slash now deals over 280 damage. We want to focus all damage on the sample, as the smaller monsters will die along with it. The sample will only revive the smaller monsters anyway if we kill them first. Without airlift in the party, we have no way of healing, and the poison damage doesn't fill our limit bars at all. Time is not on our side. Bort was only able to get off a single limit before we went down. With Rod not having Fury and Bort succumbing to poison, the damage is mostly up to Clued. He hits a second and a third cross slash, but even Clued's HP is starting to get low. Since Rod's limit bar started off halfway filled, he was able to get a Sled Fang in once, and thankfully that was just enough to take down the sample. We get a talisman for our troubles. We form a party of Clued, Airlift and Bort, and then grab the enemy skill materia. We can't use the enemy skill materia, but we'll grab it anyway, along with a few potions lying around. We rest up again before our upcoming boss rush. We use a random encounter to make sure Clued has his limit bar full and the party splits up. We use a hyper on airlift, Bort and Rod and before we make it to the elevator we use another random encounter to fill up airlift's limit bar as well. Also we want to set Bort's limit back to level 1 again. Lower level limit bars are easier to fill and we won't need an AoE limit for this boss rush anyway. We put everyone in the back row and put both the star pendant and the cover material on airlift. The first boss is 100 Gunner. Bort gets off two big shots quickly, and airlift was ready with healing wind when HP started getting low. We hit a sled fang and another big shot, but now that we have attacked four times, the 100 Gunner will start using AoE attacks instead, which is great for our limit bars. Since airlift is taking damage every round now, she is out healing all the damage that the party is taking. This means we get consistent healing throughout the battle, and after a few sled fangs and big shots, the 100 Gunner is beaten, but without a moment of reprieve, the Heli Gunner takes its place. The most annoying thing about this boss is that it can put party members to sleep, which is what happened to Airlift right away. Rod had a Sled Fang ready to go, but since Airlift is asleep, she won't cover any attacks. If it couldn't get any worse, both Bort and Rod got poisoned. Rod hits a Sled Fang again, but then he's put to sleep. Thankfully, Airlift wakes up in time to heal before anyone dies from poison, and before before long, Heli Gunner is using AoE attacks as well. Just like with the 100 Gunner, this ends up being helpful to us. Airlift does have a couple of close calls from the Heli Gun's physical attacks, but she always gets healing wind off just in time. One more big shot later and the Heli Gunner goes down. We're now in control of Clued before his boss fight, and we have an opportunity to prepare ourselves. We use a Hyper and then put Clued in the back row. We're up against Rufus and his pet dog. We need to hope that we get a turn before Rufus's dog. Otherwise, it will cast Barrier on Rufus, which temporarily halves all physical damage that we deal. The Barrier does wear off over time, but if we get a turn early enough, we can one-shot the dog with a single Cross Slash before it can cast Barrier. Now it's just a case of hitting Rufus with Cross Slash over and over as he whittles us down with his shotgun attacks. It only takes two attacks to send him running though. Good thing too, since losing this fight would mean doing the entire boss rush all over again. We earn a Protect Vest for winning this fight. In preparation for the next boss, we form a party of Clued, Tofu and Airlift. We put them all in the front row and keep the cover materia on Airlift. But we also combine the elemental and fire materia into Airlift's armour to give her increased fire resistance. It's worth noting that this materia combination on our weapons won't work in this run as it doesn't apply the elemental damage to limits. We put the Protect Vest on Tofu and then made sure that all characters had Fury again since the game all Auto heals everyone before this fight. During the highway minigame, we need to protect the car as much as possible, as letting it take damage will lower the HP of the party members inside the car before the next boss. The best way to do this is to cheese the AI. The red bikes will never overtake.
overtake Clued as long as we keep swinging our sword. The max number of enemy bikes that can be on screen at once is three. So if we stay ahead, take out the blue and orange bikes, but leave the red ones alone, eventually there will be three red bikes. And as long as we keep swinging our sword, they will never get close to the car. We can keep that up for the entire minigame, right up to the motorball boss fight. This fight is an automatic back attack against us, and we all get rammed before the fight even starts. This is why we made sure to put everyone in the front row, as being back attacked reverses the chosen rows. So we actually start in the back row here. This is going to be a tough fight. It has a pattern to its attacks, and it's good to know that pattern ahead of time. It starts off with arm attacks, and it has a chance to use this several times in a row. We get clued in the front row, and then we get hit with afterburner. Clued hits right back, but it seems to be immune to paralysis. Then we see its most powerful attack, Rolling Fire, which deals heavy fire damage to all party members. This is why we boosted Airlift's fire resistance. Keeping her alive is paramount, as we'll need her healing wind to stand a chance. Of course, we want to hit as many yares in Tofu's slots as possible for the extra damage. The motorball's pattern starts again from here, a series of arm attacks, followed by an afterburner, and then a rolling fire. Airlift covers some of the arm attacks to get her limit quicker too, and then Clued's next cross slash was a critical hit for over 600 damage. Rolling fire always seems to fill our limits too. Another thing worth mentioning is that limits take priority over other actions in battle, just like with limit breaks in Final Fantasy VIII. So if we queue up several limits in a row, they're guaranteed to happen right after one another, regardless of whether the enemy's turn should have been next or not. The only exception to this is if we get counter-attacked, but Motorball doesn't counter. With the routine we found ourselves in, we were able to take it down after several rounds. We have escaped Midgar. We make our way to Calm, but on the way we steal a new weapon for Bort, the Atomic Scissors, and not a moment too soon. Once we're in Calm, we'll grab all the items we find find lying around, and also stock up on hypers at the shop. If we need extra money, we can just sell our ethers. They sell for 750 gil each, and we'll never need them anyway. During the flashback, we can't take any actions in battle, since we don't have access to Clued's limit here. However, Sephiroth acts on his own, and easily wins every battle for us. Since we're not in control of Sephiroth, I don't count this as a rule break, as long as Clue doesn't do anything of course. After the flashback, we want the item that is out of our reach. All we have to do is try to get it several times, and eventually Clued will get so annoyed he'll kick the cabinet. The item will fall down, and it's a mega elixir. We travel to the Chocobo stables and grab the Choco Mog materia, and the Choco Lore materia. Casually, we would use the Choco Lore materia to catch a Chocobo and use it to cross the swamp to avoid the Midgar Zolum. But since we can't use items in battle, we can't use greens to get the Chocobos to stay. We would have to build our limits before the battle with a chocobo, find a chocobo, quickly kill all the enemies with our limits before the chocobo runs away, or we can just do what the speedrunners do and skip the chocobo entirely. We wait for the Zolum to travel towards the top left of the swamp. We run into the swamp and hide just behind this cliff. The Zolum will bump into the cliff and turn around. As soon as it does, we run out towards the other side of the swamp. We make it over just before the Zolum has time to turn back around. We steal the Grand Glove as we make Make our way through the cave, we find and defeat the ninja, which was more awkward than we thought. Turns out you can't use limits whilst you're a frog. Also, turns out she can use a smoke bomb and run away from you if you wait long enough. We made sure our limits were ready to go straight away next time. After that, we name her Youth. We considered stealing a new weapon for Youth, but we won't be using her until later anyway. We stock up on items at Fort Condor, and now we need to prepare for the next boss fight in Junon. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult. We want to ensure that we can deal big damage with at least one of our limits, and that means unlocking Angermax on Bort. Angermax is Bort's second level 3 limit, which means we first need him to get a total of 80 kills since learning Grenade Bomb. Fortunately, we can find groups of multiple enemies at once if we know the right areas to look, and Bort's Grenade Bomb kills them all at once, which helps to rack up the kills quickly. To speed things up, we use Hypers and put Clued and Airlift in the back row, and give Bort the cover materia. Times 3 speed up to the rescue once again. If we should ever need a rest, we can sleep at Fort Condor. Eventually, Bort gets 80 kills and unlocks his first level 3 limit, Satellite Beam. Now, we just 
just need to use Satellite Beam six times to unlock Anger Max. We put the cover materia back on airlift, make sure we're all fjorid, get all three limit breaks filled up ahead of time, and face off against the next boss, Bottoms Well. Right away, we unleash both a Cross Slash and an Anger Max. We get super lucky and we got a critical hit with Cross Slash for over 800 damage. And then Anger Max hits 18 times for about 57 damage each. Even if we exclude the odd critical hits from a couple of the Anger Max bullets, we have already dealt about 2000 damage in total, which only leaves the boss on just over 500 HP remaining. But now we're forced to wait for our limits again, and this is where Bottoms Well proves how dangerous it can be. It can trap party members inside giant bubbles that slowly drains their HP. And just like with poison damage, this does not boost our limit bars. Airlift is the first victim of this, which also means she can't take turns anymore. Bort is also trapped soon after, but fortunately, Bottoms Well won't use it again if there's only one party member left. We're just lucky that Airlift wasn't on her own here as she can't deal damage. Airlift and Bort both die from the HP drain, so now it's all up to Clued. We take a few big waves until we can use another Cross Slash. Now its HP is low enough that one more Cross Slash will kill it. He hits another big wave for big damage and we hit a Cross Slash. But Bottoms Well also has a Desperation attack that it uses after it dies. It's another big wave, which thankfully Clued was just able to survive. Bottoms Well is defeated. It drops the power wrist and we receive the Shiva materia as our reward. It's time to infiltrate Junon. For the dolphin jump, don't move. Just press square twice and you're up there. We're not too bothered about the Parade March minigame. We will be grabbing all the items we can find in Junon though, and we do want to nail the posing minigame before the boat for the best reward. A new sword for Clued, the Force Stealer. We reunite on the boat, steal everything that's not nailed down, and reform our party with the same members as before. We need to prepare for another boss fight already. We can stock up on healing items on the boat. Since Bort and Airlift got knocked out against Bottoms Well, their limit bars are empty. But we can get random encounters against Shinra guards on the boat, so we take the time to fill up our limit bars. Bort's limit bar takes longer to fill since he's set to limit level 3, but we can use that extra time to steal the Shinra beta from a guard. We could have taken the time to steal more of these, so feel free to do that yourself if you wish. Airlift gets the Shimra Beta for a defense boost, we give Bort the Power Wrist for a strength boost, and Clued gets a power boost from his new weapon. Before the boss, we grab a new weapon for Youth, the Wind Slash. We fully heal and use Hypers on everyone. It's also a good idea to make sure the Steel Materia isn't equipped to a double AP weapon, since using an upgraded Steel Materia would cause damage. Now we face off against Genova. We start the battle with Anger Max and Cross Slash right away. A single hit from Genova's laser attack gets Clued his limit again thanks to Fury, but even with Fury, Bort's limit does not fill after one hit. You can now see how little Bort's limit bar filled up off the same attack compared to Clued. This is the price we pay for limit level 3. Now she breaks out the tail lasers. They hit all three party members for big damage, and she can use it twice in a row. Airlift's healing wind would always be ready after a laser as long as she survives it. Another anger max and cross slash later, and Genova's starts using stop magic to freeze a party member temporarily. And of course, she targets our healer. Bort goes down to a couple more tail lasers and Clued gets in one final cross slash for the win. If that hadn't killed her, we probably would have lost this fight. We made sure to grab the Ifrit materia before we leave. We arrive at Costa del Sol. Did you know you could block Rod from walking up the stairs and make him freak out? We grab the fire ring from this chest, as well as every other item we find down here. There are carbon bangles for sale just in case we need a boost in defense, but the Shimra betas are still better. We swap Bort with Youth as we want Youth to learn her second limit, which means we need to use her first limit, Grease Lightning, eight times. We equip her with the Wind Slash weapon, give her the cover materia and put everyone in fury. As we travel to Mount Coral, we use random encounters to get Youth some uses of her limit. It wasn't long until Youth learns her second limit, Clear Tranquil, which has the exact same effect as Airlift's healing wind, healing exactly 50% of all party members max HP. This objectively makes Youth slightly more useful than Airlift, since Youth can use Grease Lightning to cause damage if needed. We arrive in Gold Saucer and find a new party member who wants to join us for some reason, and we call them Cat Soup. 
we find the third Turtle Paradise poster in the hotel, we get blamed for a murder, and we're sentenced to live in the desert. The party reunites and we bring Airlift and Bort with us. In preparation for the next boss fight, we set Bort's limit to level 3, if not already, and use the random encounters to fill his limit bar. This is because Bort will be facing the next boss alone. That boss is Dine, and since Bort's by himself, this means no healing at all, which might have been an issue, except Bort one-shots him with Anger Max. Dine does have a desperation attack, but Bort tanks it just fine. We may have gotten lucky with a couple of those hits being criticals, otherwise this fight might not have been so easy. I'm not sure. Once we're back in Gold Saucer, this is our only chance to grab the Ramu Materia. Now we have a buggy. We form a party of Clued, Airlift and Cat Soup. We ride our way to Gongaga. As soon as we arrive, we are thrust straight into a boss fight against Reno and Rude. This is an optional boss fight, but we decided we wanted to beat as many bosses as we could in this run. Naturally, all three party members have Fury, and Clued even starts the battle with his limit. Cat Soup's limit, Dice, comes into play for the first time, and it can be quite good. He rolls two dice, and then multiplies the result by a hundred. Both the first and second rolls we made were seven. How fitting. So we dealt 700 damage twice. We aimed all our attacks against Rude, since if one of them is defeated, they both run away. So overall, this was a fairly simple fight. We make sure to grab the Titan materia and the white megaphone before we leave Gongaga. The white megaphone is a new weapon for Cat Soup that gives double AP, so if Cat Soup has any materia, make sure it's on his weapon. It's a good idea to keep as many non-stat altering materia equipped at all times. For example, we could keep the Manipulate and the Death Blow materia equipped since they don't lower our stats. We can't make use of them in battle, but we can just let them accumulate double AP as we progress through the challenge. As we mentioned before, an exception to this is the steel materia as we don't want that to upgrade. We stop by Cosmo Canyon. There are two Turtle Paradise posters to find here, and we purchase some equipment upgrades. We need to head into the Cave of Ghee, and it's quite challenging in here. There are rocks we can break open to advance, but with each one we break, we're forced into battle against Ghee Spectres. They target the party member with the lowest current HP, which is usually always our healer. If the enemy never hits anyone else, then we can't fight back. We managed to get around this by putting the cover materia on Clued, so he would take a few hits and then fire back with a cross slash. We make sure to grab the added effect materia as this is our only chance at getting one, and it's very useful for this run. We will be keeping the added effect materia equipped from here on, preferably in a double AP slot if we have one. Towards the end of the cave, we must fight giant spiders. We went in with our limits prepared, and after using all of our limits, it still survived. This thing can hit quite hard, and if he focuses enough attacks on just one of our attackers, they could be in trouble. Thankfully, it did hit airlift once or twice, so we were able to use healing wind a couple of times. This thing had more HP than I remembered. It took several limits to bring it down. We had to fight another one of these right afterwards too. The damage from its sting bomb attack deals three quarters of the target's current HP. Clued almost died, and since we knew a sting bomb counter attack can't kill us, we used cross slash. We got a bit lucky against the last spider. It had us on the ropes at one point, but we got a healing wind just in time. Before we proceed to the boss fight, we can backtrack to Cosmo Canyon and save the game. This prevents us having to fight those giant spiders again, should we die to the boss. With this safety save, we decided to majorly gamble on this boss. We took Rod and Cat Soup with us, and we equipped Cat Soup with the Fire Ring. We travelled to the end of the cave again and started the boss fight against G attack. Many will know that he is very weak to healing items and spells, but of course we can't use those in this run. And no, you can't target enemies with airlift's limit. This means we'll have to kill it the old fashioned way. Going in with three attackers and no healer was a huge risk, but this provided an opportunity to show just how good Cat Soup's dice limit can be if you're lucky enough. Gene attack is joined by two flames that cast a lot of fire spells, but since Cat Soup is our win condition for this fight, we didn't want 
him to take too many hits in a row. That's why we equipped him with the fire ring to prevent all fire damage. So now only gene attacks hits will hurt cat soup. And thanks to Fury, his limits fill all the way with a single hit from gene attack anyway. Starting the fight with limits at the ready, cat soup was able to get two limits off fairly quickly and Rod got two sled fangs in all in the early going. The first dice roll dealt 600 damage and the second dealt 300 damage. Rod went down here, but then the third dice roll was a big one. If you roll doubles on the two dice, the damage is calculated normally, but then the total is doubled. We rolled a double six, which would have been 1,200 damage, but since it was a double, it doubled the damage to a massive 2,400 damage. From there, Clued got in three cross slashes in a row. We were lucky that the flames focused a lot of their spells on cat soup, and with that, gene attack goes down. Not going in with a healer wasn't a smart move, but the gamble paid off this time. I don't mind telling you that we lost to this boss many times before landing on this gamble strategy. We got a new weapon for Rod, the Seraph Comb. Once we arrive at Nibelheim, we scour both the town and the mansion for all the items and weapons. Now we want to open the safe. The combination is right 36, left 10, right 59, right 97. This thrusts us straight into another boss fight. It's another optional boss, but like we said, we're doing all the optional bosses we can. This boss is called the Lost Number, and it's quite the challenge in a casual playthrough, so we had our work cut out for us. Naturally, all three party members are in fury going into this battle. Lost Number will either use Punch for close to 300 damage or Bolt Magic for over 400 damage. In the front row with fury, either of these two attacks will fill our limit bars in a single hit. This means that if the Lost Number just so happens to use Bolt twice on any character that isn't a healer, they will die, and we wouldn't be able to do anything about it. We would have to hope that the Lost Number targets different party members and doesn't spam Bolt too much. In our first attempt at this fight, we got very lucky and the Lost Number didn't focus too much on a single target. Airlift always seems to be able to heal just in time before anyone died, and Cat Soup hit a lot of decent dice rolls. We were hanging on by the skin of our teeth by the end, but after dealing over 6,400 damage out of the total 7,000, he dropped both Cat Soup and Clued back to back. We weren't able to get that lucky again on repeat attempts, so it's time for a change in strategy. Before looking into things like equipment or materia, we decided to try taking both Airlift and Youth with us. Both of them heal in the exact same way, and since they both get their limits from any single hit they take in this fight, it meant that we almost always had a healing limit ready to go. This meant that the damage was pretty much all up to Clued, but with all the healing we had access to, he was able to land many cross slashes. There were a couple of close calls where Clued's HP got low, but things were going smoother overall. The main gimmick of this boss is that it's supposed to go into a second form when its HP is roughly halfway down. Its second form is different depending on whether it was a physical attack or a magic attack that put it below half HP. However, in this fight, it never went into its second form. This suggests that as far as the Lost Numbers AI is concerned, the damage caused from Clued's limit, and maybe all limits, isn't considered to be physical or magical damage. It's just neutral damage, similar to like a poison tick I guess. Either that or the temporary paralysis from Clued's cross slash messes with its AI, but I'm not complaining as its second form is a lot scarier. Cheesing its AI like this made victory a lot easier. Before we leave, we grab the Odin materia, Sephiroth throws the destruct materia at us, and a guy in a coffin asks to join our team. We called him Vincenzo. We find a new weapon for both Clued and Rod with double AP growth, and we make sure to grab all the items inside Mount Nibel at the bottom of each tube. We also steal the gold armlet from the dragon enemy that we can find here, and then we run away from that dragon enemy before he kills us. It's also important that we take the time to detour over to the Mako Fountain to find our second elemental materia. That brings us to the next boss, Materia Keeper, and for this battle we decided to bring Airlift and Rod with us. Rod's new Seraph Comb weapon gives him decent attack, which puts him about on par with Clued, and Airlift has the cover materia again. If you're wondering, the reason we don't just use Bort's Anger Max for all these bosses is that Anger Max is a level 3 limit, and thus it takes longer to fill his limit bar, plus we like to add a bit of variety to the run where we can. Materia Keeper uses a lot of different physical attacks that range in damage. They can hit very hard. Due to this, we decided 
decided to put everyone in the back row. An airlift was covering a lot of the damage too. It was slow going, but this seemed to be working well. However, when the Materia Keeper's HP gets roughly below half, it heals itself with Cure 2 for about 1000 HP. What's worse is that it also uses Trine, which deals heavy lightning damage to all targets, which, as you can see, caught us a bit off guard. For the rematch, we made sure that Airlift had the gold armlet equipped, and on that armor, we link an elemental materia with a lightning materia to reduce the lightning damage dealt to Airlift. We went in with Clude's limit at the ready, so we got a cross slash right away. We decided to play it safe and defend with everyone whilst the materia keeper is still paralyzed from the cross slash. A hell combo critical hit would one shot anyone otherwise. Defending also means that it takes two or three hits to get our limits, but we'd rather that than risk getting one shot by a critical hit. Rod hits a sled fang for very good damage as well. Airlift covers a lot and heals a lot as a result. This is pretty much our routine until Materia Keeper's HP starts to get close to halfway down. When the Materia Keeper's HP falls below half, that's when it will start using Cure 2 and Trine, but there is something we can do to prevent the Materia Keeper from using both Cure 2 and Trine completely. The Materia Keeper cycles through its attacks in order each turn, and it's only when its HP is dropped below half that it adds Cure 2 and Trine into its cycle. However, if we hit it with Clude's Cross Slash to put it below half HP and paralyze it at the same time, this prevents the Materia Keeper from adding either Cure 2 or Trine to its attack cycle. Materia Keeper needs to register that it's been hit with something after it's below half HP, but the paralysis prevents its AI from registering the fact that it's been hit. Not only that, but the damage the Materia Keeper takes whilst it's paralyzed also won't register with the Materia Keeper's AI. This means that once he's close to having less than half HP, we need to fill up both Clude's limit and Rod's limit at the same time so we can use them back to back. Clude's limit will paralyze it and Rod's limit will hit it before it can recover from the paralysis. If we keep up that routine, it will never cast Cure 2 or Trine. At one point, Materia Keeper used Hell Combo on Rod twice in a row, which would have killed him, but Rod dodged the second one. Then it went to use Big Horn on Clude, but Airlift took the damage and was able to heal the party as a result. Manipulating the boss's AI like this meant that we never needed to resist lightning damage in the first place. We were just being cautious. We kept up the double limit routine for a while, and since we were counting the damage we dealt throughout the battle, eventually we knew that the Materia Keeper was one hit away from death. At that point, either limit would have been enough to finish it off, and we just happened to get a sled fang in for the final hit. We earned a gem ring for our troubles. In Rocket Town, we buy a couple of gold armlets and stock up on items. We talk to this NPC and choose to take a look at the rocket with him and he'll give us a new sword for Clued, the Yoshiyuki. This sword is an upgrade to what we have now and its gimmick is that it becomes stronger when we have dead party members. However, after testing, this power buff does not apply to limits. There's a few more weapons and items around town to find too. We introduce ourselves to our new friend and we called him Sod. It isn't long until we're up against the next boss, Palmer. Since this battle is is a bit of a joke fight, we decided to take this opportunity to use Vincenzo. The thing is, we won't really be using Vincenzo in this run, and we're using this battle to show you why. Using his limit transforms him into the Galleon Beast, and from there, we no longer control his actions. He will attack automatically for the rest of the fight, or until he dies. We struggled to decide on whether this breaks our main rule or not. It was a limit that transformed him, but each action afterwards isn't a limit. You could make the argument that this is all part of his limit, but then there's one more drawback. Do you remember when we said that the downside to having the Fury status is that our accuracy would be decreased by 30%? This was a non-issue before as this didn't affect limits. However, it does affect Vincenzo's auto attacks after his transformation. We noticed he missed a lot of attacks, and with such a downside like that, our minds were made up. We decided
decided not to use Vincenzo's limits from now on. Palmer's ice attacks filled anyone's limit every time anyway, so it wasn't long before we finished him off with a cross slash. We got an Eden coat out of it too. Next, we head towards Wutai to start Youth's quest line. It's optional, but you know the drill by now. We brought Sod with us this time to help him learn his next limit, and right away we have a battle against Shinra guards. Sid's boost jump limit deals decent damage too, but annoyingly, these guards counter limits by putting us to sleep. Otherwise, they use AoE attacks like Grenade, but if they're gonna hit us all at the same time, they're just gonna fill all three of our limit bars at the same time, so they didn't last long. Then of course, Youth steals most of our materia and flees to Wutai. Not having our materia doesn't really change much in this run though. Once in Wutai, we steal everything that isn't nailed down. There's a new weapon for Rod and Youth hidden behind a couple of wall partitions. We find the last Turtle Paradise poster in Youth's basement, and we go to the Turtle Paradise itself to receive our rewards for finding all six posters, a bunch of sources and a mega elixir. We rescue Youth from the Don, which leads us to another battle against some Shimra guards. They're pretty much the same as the previous ones we fought. We need to use Sid's boost jump a total of seven times to learn his next limit, so these mandatory battles only help us in that regard. We head up the mountain range area where we encounter our next boss, Raps. Its physical attacks deal decent damage, and we were getting our limits with each hit, but the big problem with this boss is its Aero 3 magic. It easily one-shots anyone it hits with Aero 3, and magic damage ignores both the row we're in and whether or not we're defending. Raps can also use Scorpion Tail to poison targets. With that said, our first attempt at this boss was a bust, but we had a new plan. We swap Sod for Bort. We set Bort's limit to level 1 again, we updated his equipment, use a hyper on him and head back up the mountain range. On the way, we use random encounters to build up everyone's limit bars. We also equip both Clued and airlift with star pendants to prevent poison. We also remembered to grab the dragon lance this time. As soon as the battle starts, Bort dodges a scorpion tail right away. We use Bort's mind blow limit, his second level 1 limit that I pretty much never made use of in any of my playthroughs in this entire game until now. Mind blow completely drains wraps of all his MP, which means there will be no more Aero 3 magic coming our way. The vast majority of bosses in this game are immune to Mind Blow, but Raps is not one of them. Any subsequent limits that Bort gets, he can use Big Shot for damage instead. We're still getting our limits with each and every hit we take from this thing, and it can even attack twice in a row sometimes. We start playing it safe and use Defend when waiting for it to hit us. Although we were lucky that Raps didn't focus too much on a single target. A few cross slashes and Big Shots later, and Raps goes down. We got a Peace Ring as a reward. When Youth gives back our materia, the game equips it all randomly, so we make sure to fix that. Once that's sorted, we will need to return to a previous area. We sail the tiny Bronco back to the buggy, and then drive the buggy all the way back to Costa del Sol, then take the ferry back to Junon, and then continue to ride the buggy over the shallow water to reach a cave that we couldn't reach last time we were here. In this cave is a sleeping NPC. If we talk to him, he talks in his sleep, and he tells us how many battles we've fought so far. If we can get our total number of battles, to have matching 10s and 1s digits that are both even numbers, he will reward us. When we first entered the cave, we had fought 285 battles, so we just need 3 more battles for a total of 288. You don't even need to win those battles, you can just run away, but we won them all just in case. Now the last 2 digits are matching even numbers, which means the NPC rewards us with a bolt ring. We could have come here when we first got the buggy, but at that point the only reward we would have been able to get is an item that unlocks Aerith's level 4 limit, and as we mentioned, Airlift can never learn any limits beyond level 1 in this run. The Bolt Ring is only available as a reward after we have access to the Tiny Bronco, so we couldn't have got the Bolt Ring before the Lost Number or the Materia Keeper bosses. It was also during these three battles that we learned Sod's second level 1 limit, Dynamite. Back in Gold Saucer, we need to impress Dio in the arena to earn the Keystone, but you don't need to win at all. With our rules, we didn't even win the second fight. Dio will give us the keystone regardless. Did you know you can also block Dio from leaving this screen and make him freak out? One thing we can do before the Temple of Ancients is to sail to Bone Village and buy some diamond armlets, but otherwise we're ready to go inside. We make sure to get all the items we can find in here, there are some really good ones too. New weapons and a look plus materia. There's an NPC inside the temple that sells items
items too. We're going to get all the items from the clock room doors as well. The most important of which is the ribbon from door 5. We give that to airlift for now. We can also let the second hand knock us down to the floor below. But be warned, this puts us straight into a battle with a pincer attack. Even with a cross slash and 600 damage from a dice, it wasn't enough to defeat just one of these. Airlift and her cover materia were coming in clutch early on, and we were able to take one of them down. But the other one dropped airlift with a powerful attack. We hit it with a dice roll for a thousand damage and then a cross slash. But it was still alive. It hit Cat Soup to drop his HP down to four, but it wasn't quite enough to fill his limit. Cat Soup went down shortly after, and then Clued took two attacks attacks in a row. He survived, but he won't survive another hit. Thankfully, Clued got in one final cross slash for the win. It was also this fight that gave Clued his 120th kill and he learned his first level 2 limit, Blade Beam. Fun fact, the ribbon accessory prevents all status abnormalities on whoever has it equipped. But did you know that if that character already has a status abnormality, the ribbon prevents it from being removed when that character dies? This this means that when Airlift died, she maintained her Fury status. This will save us a few hypers going forward. Our reward for that fight was a new weapon for Clued, the Nail Bat. It's the most powerful weapon Clued has so far, but its downside is that it has no materia slots whatsoever. That's not really an issue for us right now though, so we equip it. Any materia Clued had in his weapons can be added to another character's spare slots. It's time to prepare for the next boss. We put a fire ring on Airlift and the power our wrist on Clued. We also switched Clued to limit level 2 and prepared all characters limits ahead of time. We can also combine the elemental materia with a fire materia to help reduce the fire damage on someone. Now we're ready to face the red dragon. The reason we gave Airlift the fire ring is to make her immune to its most powerful attack, red dragon breath. Although the dragon decided to hit Clued with it instead, we fire off our limits right away. Clued's blade beam does 1495 damage and Katsup rolled for a big 2,000 damage. Cat Soup took heavy damage from Dragon Breath, but that allowed him to roll another pair of dice for another double. That's an additional 1,600 damage. Both Clued and Cat Soup are very weak now, but Clued got off another Blade Beam for 1,532 damage. Clued got dropped right afterwards, so we need Airlift to take the next hit so she can use Healing Wind first. The Dragon targets Cat Soup though, but Airlift covers him to take the hit, but then she dodged it. How do you cover a hit and then dodge it? The dragon killed Cat Soup right after that, and this attempt died at the final hurdle. In the rematch, the dragon used Dragon Breath on Airlift this time, so the fire ring came in useful after all. We dealt 900 damage with our first dice roll and 1,453 damage with Blade Beam. A second Blade Beam dealt over 1,500 damage and Airlift brushed off another Dragon Breath. The dragon's bite attack gave Airlift her limit right away, so she healed a fair a bit this time. Also, if Airlift defends and then covers someone, she takes reduced damage from the defending still. We hit a third blade beam for over 1,500 damage, and Cat Soup rolls for 1,000 damage. The dragon then killed Cat Soup. One more limit should do the trick, and the suspense was killing me. Airlift kept getting hit with Dragon Breath attacks, which wasn't doing any damage to her, and Clued actually dodged two attacks in a row. This went on for a while, so we made a risky decision. Instead of using Using Healing Wind for what felt like the 20th time this battle, we let Airlift go down. Now Clued was the dragon's only target, we just had to hope he didn't get a lucky crit. This ended up being the perfect decision. Clued took a couple more hits and he hit the final blade beam for the win. We got the dragon armlet and the Bahamut materia for winning. Now is the time to give Airlift her weakest weapon. Her attack and magic stats are useless in this run anyway and after the next boss we permanently lose whatever weapon and armor she has equipped. We do keep the accessory and materia though. Now we need to prepare for another boss. No rest for the weary. Demon Wall is the toughest boss so far. It drops rocks on our head for decent damage, and for every
every 2,500 damage it takes, it hits everyone with Demon Rush. After that, only Airlift was left on her feet, so Attempt 1 died very early. What's more, it has 10,000 HP in total, so we already know it's going to use Demon Rush at least three times in this battle, probably even four times since it can use it straight away. We go in a bit better prepared next time. Demon Wall can petrify targets if we're unlucky, so we put the Gem Ring on Airlift and the Ribbon on Clued. This prevents those two from being petrified. We can also use the Elemental Materials combined with Shiva or Ice Magic on two of our characters to reduce damage from its Caven attack, since that's classed as an Ice attack. The Dragon Armlet has the same effect, since it halves Fire, Ice and Lightning damage, so our third character will have that equipped. Our second attempt went a lot better than the first. It used Demon Rush straight away, and then it dropped a rock on Airlift. We healed, and then Catsuit rolled for 2,000 damage. Demon Wall used Cave In, and we noticed the reduced damage this time. Blade Beam hits for over 1,300 damage, and we knew Demon Rush was coming up. We quickly used Defend with everyone, which really helped. And then our second dice roll hit for 1,000 damage. Our luck continued as a third dice roll hit for another 2,000 damage again. We defend against the Demon Rush again, and Clued hits another Blade Beam for over 1,300 damage. Our fourth dice roll was another double and dealt 1,600 damage. That is three doubles in this fight. We have now dealt over 9,200 damage, and one more Blade Beam would seal the deal. Demon Rush is coming up, and Airlift will get her limit off it. However, right when we didn't want her to, she dodged it. Catsoup goes down, and Clued is weak. We need Airlift to survive a single hit so she can heal, and she takes a rock to the head, but she lived on just 6 HP. We quickly used a healing wind, but a second rock killed Airlift first. Turns out Demon Wall can use two rocks in a row sometimes. What a way to learn that lesson. One more rock after that and Clued goes down too. We need to prepare even better. Thankfully, we can still find random encounters before the Demon Wall boss fight, but only in the room where we fought the Red Dragon. It turns out we were only three blade beams away from learning Clued's second level 2 limit, Klim Hazard. It only took a single battle of just blade beams to unlock that, and it deals more damage than blade beam. We also get into a second battle to build up everyone's limit bars before this boss. We make sure everyone is in the back row before we face off against the Demon Wall again. Right away, we use both Klim Hazard and dice, which in total dealt over 2,700 damage. We quickly used Defend with everyone before it has time to charge us with a Demon Rush. We held off on the heal as we weren't damaged too badly, but Cat Soup took a rock to the head, so we healed right after. We followed that up with another dice which dealt the maximum of 2,400 damage. We've dealt over 5,000 damage in total now, which means another Demon Rush was coming our way. We had just enough time to defend ourselves though. Now, this is where it starts spamming back-to-back -back rocks. But Fortunately, he didn't hit the same party member twice in a row, or they would have died. This allowed Clued to hit another Klim Hazard for over 1,700 damage, and then a dice, although the dice roll was only 400 this time. But then Demon Wall hyper-focused on Airlift for some reason, and she went down. Demon Wall has around 2,700 HP remaining. Clued and Katsoop's HP were both full, so he still had a chance at pulling this off. He chipped at our HP with Cave In, but then he finally used his Petrify. However, he used it on Clued, who has protection from Petrify thanks to the Ribbon. A rock gave Cat Soup another dice for 1,100 damage, and Cat Soup even managed to just survive another rock, which meant he could roll again for 400 more damage. This means the Demon Wall has just over 1,000 HP left. Cat Soup couldn't survive a third rock, but Clued was able to get in one last Klim Hazard for the win. We'll be taking that Gigas Armlet, thank you. Now we must travel through Bone Village and towards the City of Ancients. Since we no longer have Airlift in the party, we make sure to have Youth take her place as she is the only other character with a consistent healing limit. On the way, we grab the Water Ring and we're already preparing for another boss fight. We add Bort to the team, set him to limit level 3 and build all three of our limits ahead of time. We equip the Talisman to Youth for a plus 10 spirit, which in this game is actually magic defense. You might already know that the magic 
basic defense stat in the original Final Fantasy VII was bugged and didn't work, but since we're playing the HD version, that bug has been fixed. Jonova Life's main gimmick is that she only uses water elemental attacks. In a casual playthrough, we would swear by the water ring to prevent all water damage, but if we used that, then that character would never be able to charge their limits. Jonova's attacks didn't seem all that dangerous at first, and we were able to land some heavy hits early on. However, it's when she breaks out the aqua lung that things go south. The first time she used it, she wiped out our entire party in one go. We tried again right afterwards, and we just hoped she wouldn't use Aqualung before we could kill her this time. We used Angermax and Klimhazard immediately for about 3,600 damage and 2,000 damage respectively. We took some water damage, but we had Youth's clear tranquil at the ready. She hit Bort twice with a single target water attack, and thankfully he just survived in critical HP. This meant a second Angermax was coming her way for roughly another 3,600 damage, and even though she killed Bort right after, at least she didn't use Aqualung. She followed this up with a series of single target water attacks, so we probably got a bit lucky this time. That meant it wasn't too long before Clued got a Klim Hazard to end this fight, and we earned a Wizard Bracelet. As we pursue Sephiroth, we grab all the items we find along the way. We grab some new weapons and armor. There's a Bolt Armlet, which is armor that absorbs lightning, and the Magic Plus Materia. After the snowboarding section, there's a cave with an elixir inside. Normally, after collecting an item, we can't move until the text box disappears. This particular text box is an exception to that rule. Since the item doesn't disappear from the overworld until the text box disappears, we can leave the cave with the text box on screen. And then if we return, the elixir is still there. However, doing this still puts the elixir in our inventory. So if we do it again, we can duplicate this elixir. We can do this as many times as we want. We could even go all the way to 99 elixirs. Since we're not using items in battle anyway, it doesn't really break the run too much, but I had to mention it. Further on, there's a hidden chest behind what looks like a solid wall, but you can just walk right through it and find a second ribbon. Soon, we ran into an enemy called a Stilver, which uses its magic breath attack on us. This one-shots both Yuf and Tofu. If I didn't just happen to have the Bolt Armlet on Clued, he would have died as well. Thankfully, the Bolt Armlet meant that Clued absorbed that damage instead, and then we ran away. We find a Fire Armlet in a chest, and following that, we need to battle three giant icicles one at a time. They don't do anything, but they are joined by several bats. If we defeat all of the bats before hitting the icicle, then we can't win this battle. The icicles don't hit us, which means we can never get our limits from them. So just make sure to target the icicles before killing the bats. Now we must face perhaps the toughest boss in the run so far, Skizo. It's a two-headed dragon. One head uses ice breath and the other uses fire, but we do have some equipment to help protect us against these elements. We go in with a party of Clued, Bort, and Yuf. We prepare all three limits first, and we start the fight with an Angermax and a Klim Hazard. Each head is a separate target, so we decided to target the right one first. Skizo then piled on the damage and killed Clued. Bort has the fire ring, so he's immune to any of the fire attacks. Yuf gets weak, but there's no point in changing rows or defending in this fight, as Skizo uses only magic attacks anyway. We just couldn't survive its barrage of fire and ice attacks, and attempt one was a failure. We needed to prepare a lot more for this one. Not only do we have to take out both heads, but each head has 18,000 HP. We threw on as much elemental protection as we could and gave it another try. We lasted a bit longer this time, but Clued and Bort eventually went down. We were then in an odd position, where Youth would take ice damage, but then get healed from the fire damage right afterwards, since she had the fire armlet equipped. The ice damage would allow her to use Grease Lightning every time, and then on Skizo's next turn, he would just heal her with fire. We were able to keep this up for a good while, but there is a problem with this strat. Each head counters with Tremor after it takes a certain amount of hits, and this deals big earth damage to all three party members. The right head will counter with Tremor every five hits it takes, and the left head with every sixth hit it takes. Skizo followed up Tremor with a couple of ice breath attacks and it was game over. So not only does Skizo use fire, ice and earth, but when each head dies, it has a final desperation electric attack as well. We need to better balance our elemental protection across the whole party. We don't want to set things up in such a way where a single character is immune to both fire and ice, because if we do, then sure that character will be able to survive longer, 
but they'll never get a limit either. We trial and errored this fight so many times with so many different equipment and materia setups that this boss was easily the cause of the vast majority of deaths in this run so far. Eventually, we went in with this setup. We swapped Bort for Sod. Clued is equipped with the Fire Armlet to absorb fire damage and the Talisman to boost his magic defense. Clued also has an elemental materia combined with Ramu in his armor to reduce lightning damage. Sod has the Bolt Armlet equipped to absorb lightning damage and the Fire Ring to nullify fire damage. Sod also has an elemental materia combined with Shiva on his armor to reduce ice damage. Yuf has the Dragon Armlet equipped to half fire, ice and lightning damage. We considered equipping the Bolt Ring as well to nullify lightning damage, but since Yuf was already taking half lightning damage anyway, we decided we were better without it. We also swapped Clued back to limit level 1 so that he would be able to get off his limit after each hit he takes. We target the right head exclusively at first, and Clued got a cross slash early. Skizo is immune to paralysis though, so we settle for the 1700 damage. After a single ice breath, Clued gets a second cross slash for another 1700 damage. We want to see fire breath a lot as this heals Clued and doesn't affect Sod. If fire breath hits Yuf, she'll take half damage and still get her limit to heal the party. It's the ice attacks that are going to be filling our other limits, and that's what gets Sod his boost jump for over 1300 damage. That's pretty much the early routine for this boss. We just need to hope that a single party member didn't get hit with too many ice attacks back to back. We make sure Yuf has healed everyone before going for the fifth hit on the right head, as this will trigger its tremor counter attack. Thanks to that, we all survived and everyone got their limits too. Skizo got a turn in before Yuf could heal again, but thankfully it was a fire attack on Clued. Sod even got a crit on his next boost jump. A couple of cross slashes and a boost jump later, and Skizo countered with Tremor again. It used Ice Breath on Yuf right after, but since she halves ice damage, she just survives, and she heals the party. Now, the right head has 321 HP left. Sod and Clued both got their limits from a Tremor, but instead of using a single target limit to finish off the right head, we used Sod's Dynamite to hit both heads together. This was still enough to finish off the right head, and we got a bit of damage on the left head. Of course, the right head still uses its Lightning Desperation attack as it dies, but our preparations paid off, and we all survived. Now there won't be any more Fire Breath attacks, only Ice, which means we'll get our limits quick, but if Skizo focuses too much on either Clued or Sod, then they will die. Thankfully, Yuf takes her fair share of Ice Breaths, so she can keep us healed. Clued and Sod even got Lucky Crits back to back too. After the sixth hit, Skizo's left head countered with Tremor, only this time we weren't quite prepared for it, and Clued went down. Skizo used Ice Breath on both Sod and Yuf in turn, but Yuf's limit bar didn't quite fill up. Sod nailed a boost jump but died right afterwards. Skizo has just 3000 HP remaining and we're now getting damaged for over 400 per Ice Breath, but Yuf was healing for over 600 HP every time she got hit. Since we were healing by just a bit more than we were being damaged, eventually, if we spent every turn healing, Yuf would eventually get her max HP of 1264. Only then is it safe to go for a Grease Lightning attack. We got a lucky crit for nearly 2900 damage. Just one more Grease Lightning and Skizo goes down. We survive the second Ice Breath, but we cannot use Grease Lightning right away. If we do, Skizo will die, but its Lightning Desperation attack will kill us too. We had to use Clear Tranquil every turn until we had close to full HP again, and only then could we go for a Grease Lightning after a Breath attack. This ensured that we had just enough HP to survive that Desperation attack, and even then, only because Yuf took half damage from Lightning attacks, Skizo finally goes down for good, and we got that Dragon Fang. We're not out of the woods yet. Due to a bug in the game, we cannot flee random encounters on this screen, so we take the time to heal before moving just in case. There's a chance they fix this bug in the HD version, but we're not taking that chance. We go back to the previous area before this boss. Here we can find these dragons, and defeating them will reward us with more dragon armlets, just like what you've had equipped. We took the time to get more of these after Skizo, just in case. Maybe they could have helped us with Skizo, but then we wouldn't have been able to absorb any elements like we did. 
standard. We find the Neo Bahamut materia as we proceed, and we make sure to avoid the wind to ensure the fewest encounters possible. We're forced to have Tofu in the party, so we swap out Bort and keep Youth. All three party members will have a Dragon Armlet equipped to half all fire damage, and as an extra precaution, Tofu has Elemental materia combined with Ifrit materia to resist fire even more. The extra Dragon Armlets will help with the next boss, Genova Death. This time, Genova uses nothing but fire elemental attacks. As usual, we use a hyper on everyone, and with limit level 1, it doesn't take much to fill our limit bars. Genova likes to spam red light and tropic wind a lot, and this gives Tofu her limit in a single hit, and with some good timing on the slots, we rack up some damage fairly quickly. Genova even spread the damage somewhat evenly across all party members, so the healing was as consistent as the damage we were dealing. This boss is a good example of why we don't want to overlevel in this run in general. Since all of Genova's attacks deal magic damage, they all use up MP. If we had overleveled before this boss and had really high HP totals, it would have been possible to see Genova run out of MP before we were able to use limits enough times to finish her off. It was nice to have an easy boss fight after Schizo, so we're not complaining and we earned the Reflect Ring as a reward. And we can grab the MP Turbo Materia right afterwards too. After some cutscenes, we find ourselves captured in Junon. Cat Soup busts Bort out and they must defeat a couple of guards. Since we left Bort on limit level 1, one, the last time we had control of him, we were able to take down these guards before they could deal enough damage to kill us. After escaping Junon, we head over to Medial and stock up on items. This is the point where the newest weapon upgrades are starting to get a bit too expensive for us. With all the random encounters that we've been fleeing, we don't have a lot of cash. We start off by selling all our ethers as we're still never going to need them. And then we sell our old weapons. Now we can buy some upgrades, but we don't bother with Cat Soup or Vincenzo's weapons. These weapon upgrades offer more materia slots so we fill them with any materia that doesn't negatively affect our stats. We find a key hidden under a plank outside, and we try to open the door in the weapon shop. It doesn't work, but if we choose to tell the truth, then the shopkeeper will give us the curse ring. This ring will boost strength and magic by 35, vitality, spirit and dexterity by 15, and luck by 10. However, the downside is, it also inflicts the death sentence ailment, which is basically the same as the doom status from the new Final Fantasy games. This means that any character with this ring equipped will start every battle with a countdown, and when that countdown hits zero, they die immediately. However, if that character were also immune to the death status, the countdown won't kill them, and they can purely benefit from the curse ring's stat buffs. We can be immune to death if, on our armor, we combine the added effect materia with the destruct materia. We did this with Bort, and it works perfectly. This will be very useful for the second segments coming up, which is actually kind of like a mini boss rush with 5 battles, all with a 10 minute time limit. It's not mandatory to beat this mini boss rush, but we'd like to. We need to make some preparations first though. Since we've lost Cloud at this part of the story, we form a party of Sod, Bort and Youth, and they all have their newest weapons equipped. As we mentioned, Bort will have the Curse Ring set up with the Death Immunity. We equip a couple of green materials to Youth to lower her max HP a little bit. This is to ensure that she gets her limits quicker. Youth and Sod will also have a ribbon equipped, and Bort has his limit set to level 3. Before the mini boss rush starts, we must battle two guards. They're not very threatening, but after defeating one of them, we want to make sure that we fill up all three of our limit bars together. When that happens, have Youth heal the party, and then have Sod use boost jump immediately afterwards. Youth will ensure that the party is as healed as we can be going into the mini boss rush, and Sod will one shot the guard anyway. The way we've set things up means that Bort starts the mini boss boss rush with his limit ready to go. The first enemy is a single gas ductor, but Bort's anger max combined with the strength boost from the curse ring deals over 6000 damage and one shots the gas ductor. The second battle is against two gas ductors, and now we don't have any limits ready. The gas ductor's smog alert attack will remove our fury and poison the target, which did happen to Bort. And since Bort has the curse ring equipped for extra damage, he can't use an accessory to prevent these status ailments. But thankfully, they both targeted Bort early on, so we got off an anger max quite quickly. This killed one of the gas ductors and weakened the other. Bort's poison was whittling away at his HP, and he 
he went down soon after. Gas Doctor used Smog Alert again on Youth, but since she had a ribbon equipped, all it did was fill her limit bar. A Grease Lightning was enough to finish this fight. We have a chance to use items between battles, so we quickly revive Bort, heal up, and reapply Fury where needed. The third battle is against the Wolfmeister, and it has 10,000 HP, and it can hit quite hard. Since we're all in the front row, we're taking heavy damage, but we're getting limits quickly too. If he targets either Bort or Sod twice in a row, they will likely die. Bort got an Anger Max early for roughly 6,000 damage. You've healed right after, and Sod got two boost jumps back to back for over 1,500 damage each. This means Wolfmeister has less than 1,000 HP left, but then he gets a crit on Bort and one-shots him. You've took a hit, and since we knew Grease Lightning would be enough to finish it off, that's what we did. Once again, we quickly use items to heal up and fury up, and then we fight the Eagle Gun, which has over 17,000 HP. It uses AoE attacks too, which is perfectly fine by us, since that helps to fill all our limit bars together. This means an Anger Max came early for 6,000 damage, and a boost jump shortly after that for over 1,600. The AoE attacks ensure that you can heal at a high rate, but it did get close to wiping us out at the end. Another Anger Max drops the Eagle Gun. We heal up, and that brings us to the final fight against a regular Shinra Guard. We only have a minute remaining. However, Yuf and Sod had their limits ready to go, so a single Grease Lightning was all it needed to end this mini boss rush. We get the Ultima Materia, and we unlock Bort's level 4 limit if we talk to this NPC, and it's called Catastrophe. Next, we head to Fort Condor, and if you ever wanted to win this tower defense mini game, there is an easy way. Place a single fighter as low down as possible, start the combat, and then lower the combat speed as low as possible. Now quickly place another fighter as low as possible, which should be just below the first one we placed. Repeat this until we can place units as low as the game will allow. Now we want to place a line of attackers as low as we can to attack the only enemy on screen. We command all attackers to move towards the only enemy, and if they defeat that enemy before the second one can show up, the game just counts it as a win, and we get the Phoenix Materia. We don't want to do this in this run though. We want to lose this mini game on purpose, as this forces a battle against a Grand Horn. It can hit hard and fast, but it has only 2000 HP, so beating it isn't too hard. Although it does have a desperation attack that only you've survived, the reward for this battle is the Imperial Guard, and we still get the Phoenix Materia anyway. Back in Medieval, we fight Ultimate Weapon, and this thing has some devastating attacks, but mercifully, it flies away after it takes its third turn. After a lengthy cutscene, we get clued back in the party, and we head back to Junon. As we make our way to the underwater reactor, we need to battle several Shinra guards, so we make sure to take some hypers ahead of time. As usual, the guards are pushovers, but when we get to the end, we encounter our next boss fight, Carry Armor. This boss has three body parts that can be targeted, the body and both arms. The arms deal physical damage, but the body uses Lapis Laser for ridiculous damage on all party members, and since the arms act independently, Carry Armor can follow up Lapis Laser with a couple of physical attacks, and this drops both Youth and Clued. We're going to need to be a lot better prepared for this one. We've been putting it off for a while now, but it's finally time to buy some HP plus materia. Each HP plus materia, when equipped, boosts that character's max HP by 10%. The maximum that each character's HP can be increased via HP plus materia is 100%, or double. This means that 10 HP plus materias on a single character is the most we should ever equip at once. The problem is, HP plus materia costs 8,000 gil each, so we need to sell even more stuff. We decided to sell the Reflect Ring for 6,000 gil. The Reflect Ring could theoretically have been very useful for upcoming battles, as it would have automatically reflected all magic attacks back at the user, but we decided that this was a grey area with our limit only rule. Even though we're reflecting the enemy's magic back at them, it still kind of feels like we're responsible for the magic damage. We still need more money though, so we resort to selling some materia. This is the reason we've been equipping as many materia as we can that don't alter our stats too much, as materia sells for the exact same amount of AP that we've earned for each given materia. So we sell some of the less useful materia that we've had for a long time, like sense or throw. We also head over to Rocket Town to grab a new piece of armor that is now there, the fourth bracelet. Just so you know, even with all the preparation possible, we're still at the mercy of RNG. Carry Armor has a chance to grab a party member with its arm. This renders both that arm and that party member useless until they're freed. Only by destroying that arm with a limit would we be able to 
to free them, and it's very possible for carry armor to grab two party members at once. For our best chance at winning, we'd prefer to never get grabbed at all. And it is for this reason that we failed this fight as many times as we did. Even more times than Schizo. In fact, when carry armor grabs two party members, since both of the arms no longer attack, carry armor will then just spam lapis laser for big damage every turn. If carry armor should run out of MP before we could free anyone, then we're just soft locked forced to stand here, watching Clued and Sod get spun around forever. It's also possible for carry armor to grab a party member immediately as the fight starts. If that ever happens, it's best to just restart. After selling all we could bear to part with, we were able to afford 14 HP plus materials. We equipped them all across Clued, Youth and Sod for a good max HP boost, but we gave Youth the most to ensure that she had the highest HP. We equip Clued with the fourth bracelet, as this gives very good magic defense and a good number of materia slots and we gave him the talisman for extra magic defense. We equip youth with the wizard bracelet as this also gives decent magic defense and still has plenty of materia slots. She has a talisman as well for more magic defense and we gave her the cover materia too. Sod is equipped with the imperial guard for both physical and magic defense. Sod also has the cursed ring equipped along with the added effect and destruct materia to grant immunity to instant death. We also took the time to fill all three limit bars before the boss. This is about as prepared as we possibly can be. But annoyingly, carry armor used lapis laser immediately. The reason we wanted Sod for this battle is his dynamite limit. Apparently, if the carry armor's arms are hit just once, this lowers the chance of that arm grabbing us. So if we don't get grabbed right away, Sod can use dynamite on turn one to damage both arms. It also dealt over a thousand damage to the body. Clued followed up with over 1,000 1,800 damage and we had to use youth's clear tranquil straight away. From now on we target the body exclusively since the arms will die along with it. After the barrage of limits we have everyone defend themselves so we can tank the physical attacks. Youth covers a lot of them too. Now when we get hit with lapis laser we take the damage much better than we did before and all three party members easily get their limits off it too. We can follow up every lapis laser with a clear tranquil followed by a cross slash and a boost jump. This setup has given us much better survivability and everything we've just done becomes our routine for practically the whole fight. The biggest issue we face now is if carry armor focuses too many physical attacks on a single party member and then follows up with a lapis laser. You can't fully heal that party member with clear tranquil in that case and this is exactly what happened to Clued throughout the battle. He was being slowly whittled down each round. This allowed him to hit more cross slashes but before long he was barely barely surviving the lapis lasers. He got dropped to 10 HP, but luckily, when the arms attacked right after, they targeted one of the other two party members instead. Sod got a big crit for over 4,600 damage at one point, but the close calls continued. We just had to hope Clue didn't take too many more physical attacks along with the lapis laser, but that's exactly what happened. This put him on just 13 HP, so it's a good thing we were defending ourselves there. Just one more limit after that, and carry armor is defeated defeated just in time. We don't even get to save the game after winning this fight, as we have to fight some Shinra guards aboard the submarine, but not before getting a new weapon for Sid, the Scimitar and the Leviathan Scales. We win the first couple of battles against the Shinra Guards as they are pushovers, but we forgot the third fight was an automatic pincer attack against us. We were woefully unprepared for that fact, and we actually died here, which means we had to beat carry armor all over again. Thankfully, as long as we don't get grabbed, the setup we used before still works just fine. This time, we heal the party members after the battle against the carry armor and between each battle against against the guards. This makes the pincer attack at the end no problem. Also, the submarine chase minigame is barely worth mentioning. If you go forward and spam the shoot button, you win in seconds. Now we go back to Wutai and use the Leviathan scales to put out the fires in the cave. This gets us a new weapon for youth. We take the submarine down to the Gelnica and find a new weapon for Clued and face off against Reno and Rude. Reno can confuse party members, so we use the two ribbons and the peace ring to protect all three party members against confusion, which makes this fight quite easy. In fact, there's a bug with this fight that I'm surprised never got fixed with any re-release of this game. If Rude uses any attack that isn't his physical attack, he will no longer take any actions for the rest of the battle. Sure enough, Rude uses magic and he can no longer
longer take any actions. This means Reno is basically on his own for the rest of the fight. However, we must target Rude before Reno. If we defeat Reno first, the game will still want us to finish off Rude before the fight will end, and if he doesn't hit us, we can never get our limits, and thus, we can never win. We also steal the Zydrich from Rude before ending this fight. The battle itself is super basic with the setup we have. A couple of hits from Reno is enough to get a limit on any character, it just takes ages since Reno likes to spam his confusion attack. The only way we lose this fight is if Reno spams attacks against someone who can't heal, but in the end, Clued got a critical cross slash and finished him off. Now we can loot the Gelnicker for some new weapons, the Hades Materia, an Escort Guard, and the Double Cut Materia. We can't make use of everything, but we grab it all anyway. We make sure to flee all random encounters down here too, as they can be very dangerous. At this point, we decided to complete Youth's side quest, and defeat all the bosses inside the tower in Wutai. Youth must face all these bosses alone, so we equip her with the Zydrich for the best defense, the Conformer for the best attack, and the Ribbon to protect her against all status effects. We also load up her weapon with HP plus materia, since the Zydrich has no materia slots. The first boss is Gorky, and even though he used Barrier, we still one-shot him with Grease Lightning. We can't change rows in these fights, which means these battles have unique scripting. For example, the first physical attack that Youth lands on these bosses will deal double damage. We can heal and save the game between each fight, thankfully. The second boss is called Shake, and its attacks are quite weak. Thank goodness for speed up, we finally get damaged enough to use a Grease Lightning, but Shake will counter with Rage Bomb for decent damage. We just got another limit before we died. One more Grease Lightning was enough to defeat him. The third boss is Chekhov, and apparently it's possible that Chekhov won't take any action until we hit them first. If we don't have a limit ready to go, then we just get softlocked as soon as the fight starts. So, we reload, leave town, get a random encounter outside, fill Youth's limit bar, return to Wutai, and this time, we one-shot Chekhov with Grease Lightning. The fourth boss is Staniv, and they also go down in a single Grease Lightning. But not the fifth and final boss, Godo. His attacks can cause a lot of status effects, but the ribbon prevents them all. Demi-3 still deals good damage though. Godo has 10,000 HP, and we went for a Grease Lightning for over 3,500 damage, but Youth gets whittled down quite low, and a Trine puts her in critical HP before she got her limit. We knew we couldn't kill Godo in one more hit, so we needed to heal instead. We need to keep healing every time we get our limit until we have full HP. We're able to do this since we can heal for just more than the damage we're taking. We finally went for a second Grease Lightning, but Godo healed itself right away, which puts us right back in the routine of healing every time. When we went for a third Grease Lightning, it was very risky, as we had relatively low HP, and we might not have gotten another chance to get a limit after this, but we got very lucky, and it was a crit for over 7,500 damage. Godo goes down, and next up we need to take on Rude again in Rocket Town, but not before a few more Shinra guards. The biggest annoyance with these guards is that it takes ages for them to damage us enough for us to use our limits. It would have been quicker to take off the HP plus materials for these fights. Rude is joined by a couple more guards, but they go down in a single hit just like the rest of them. Rude doesn't hit too hard compared to previous bosses, but he does hit often. We stole a second Zydrich. Rude hit so many times in quick succession that Clued went down after a cross slash. Sod got a couple of boost jumps in, but he went down soon after too. Youth was on our own now, but thankfully he was just one Grease Lightning away from defeat. There's one more guard inside the rocket. He's stronger than the others, but it only takes two limits to beat him. We get the final huge materia with the code, since we're playing on the PlayStation. The code is Circle Square XX. It was now that we decided to try our luck against the Midgar Zolum, and now all it takes to beat it is two limits. So that was anticlimactic. The next boss might not be so easy though, Diamond Weapon. It has 30,000 HP and uses both a fire attack and a stomp attack that always targets the character with the highest current HP. To start with, Diamond Weapon is immune to physical attacks until it opens its armor. However, limits still deal damage as normal as we can see with this cross slash. Unfortunately, Diamond Weapon starts a countdown whenever it's hit with either a summon or a limit, and during this countdown it spams its fire attacks, Laser Ray. When the countdown ends, it uses Diamond Flash, which reduces all party members down to 7 eighths of their max HP. This fills all our limit bars though, so we heal half our max HP 
HP and fire off two limits back to back. This triggers another countdown right away, and as long as we can survive the laser rays during the countdown itself, we will always survive the diamond flash at the end. This routine continues, but every time we get hit with diamond flash, our HPs fall lower and lower until we can only ever get healed to about 50% of our max HP. Diamond Weapon only gets three laser rays during its countdown, and it would need to hit one party member with all three of them to kill them. Thankfully, we never got that unlucky in this fight, and Diamond Weapon soon goes down. We swapped Sod for Bort at this point, because we want to take on the optional boss, Ultimate Weapon. We set Bort to limit level 4, built up his limits ahead of time, and we also gave him the Cursed Ring and Death Immunity setup. Ultimate Weapon starts off with an attack on Clued for decent damage, but we fire back with a Cross Slash for 3,500 damage, and then we hit Bort's Catastrophe for over 11,000 damage. Ultimate Weapon hits us all with his Ultima Beam for big damage, except you've dodged the attack completely, which is bad news if we wanted healing. We can see that Bort's limit bar only filled up about halfway, even with Fury. This is due to him being on limit level 4. Weapon hits Bort one more time right after the Ultima Beam and now he has his limit again. Clued gets a cross slash off and Bort fires off one more catastrophe for about 15,000 more damage combined. Ultimate Weapon flies off at this point and flies around the overworld. We need to chase him down and get back into a fight with it, but the good thing is he doesn't recover any of the damage we've already dealt to it. It has a grand total of 100,000 HP. We take the opportunity to heal ourselves between each fight whilst the weapon is flying around. After charging into it enough times, eventually the weapon will beeline for a certain spot on the map, and that's where we fight it next. The way the battle works is the exact same every time. He hits Bort first, and then hits everyone with Ultima Beam. We queue up all of our limits for another 15,000 damage, and it flies off again. We repeat this multiple times. Sometimes it hits us enough to fill our limits, and other times it just flies off straight away. But that just means we're ready to deal major damage in the next encounter. When it has under 20,000 HP remaining, it will fly close to Cosmo Canyon. If it does this, then we know that this is the final battle, and this is where we can defeat it for good. In the final fight, Bort got hit twice in a row, so he fired right back with a catastrophe for another 11,000 damage. But then, an Ultima Beam took Bort down. You've healed, and Clued hit a cross slash for over 3,400 damage. It turns out, Ultimate Weapon has a desperation attack called Shadow Flare and he wiped Clued out with this easily. Yuf was the only survivor, and with her still standing, we just won this fight, and we earned Clued's Ultima Weapon. Upon defeat, Ultimate Weapon falls out of the sky and hits the ground, forming a large crater. This crater allows us to enter the Ancient Forest, and that's where we're going next. We want the reward at the end of this forest puzzle, so here's how you get through the forest. We pick up all the insects in the first area and move them close to the pitcher plants on the right. Now we can put an insect in each plant one at a time to get them to close, but we need to be quick so we can jump over them before they open. Once we're on the other side, we can enter the second area and jump to the higher platform. This allows us to get over the plant on the ground. Grab the frog and put it inside the plant on the right and then stand on the plant. After a few seconds, the plant will spit out the frog and will be flung far to the right. We enter the third area, we grab the insect further to the right and bring it back to the left side to throw into the first plant. We quickly grab the second insect to get over the second plant, and the vine swings us to the treetops. We can go over the top and to the right to get back down on the other side of the tree stump blocking our way. We can reach the wasp's nest up top and throw it into the big plant on the ground to get it out of our way. Then we grab the insect down here, use it on the plant to get back to the left side, then grab another insect and put it close to this hole in the tree. This lures out a frog from the hole. We put the frog close to the plant on the right, then grab an earlier insect, use that insect to close the plant on the right, quickly grab the frog and bring it over to the right side. We put the frog in the rightmost plant and stand on it, waiting for it to burst open. This sends us over to the cave at the end of the forest, and now we can grab our reward. A new weapon for Clued, the Apocalypse. It's not quite as powerful as his Ultima weapon, but it provides triple AP for any materia slotted into it, and that will be very useful later. It's time Time to return to Midgar and find Hojo. We can totally skip two bosses in Midgar if we wanted to, but we decided we didn't want to skip any bosses in this run, but I'll still show you
you how to do it. At this point in the story, if we fly over to the northern crater, there will be a cutscene of the Shinra members in a meeting room. And then the cutscene cuts to show Hojo somewhere else in Midgar. We can perform the skip during this very cutscene. All we need to do is wait for the scene in the meeting room, and then during that scene, we hold down right on the D-pad, or just hold the left analog stick down right. If you don't have auto run turned on, then hold the run button as well. If we do this, the party will suddenly appear next to Hojo, ready to challenge him to a battle. Clued is invisible briefly, but regardless, this skips most of the return to Midgar. This cutscene is another example of a time when Clued shouldn't be able to move, but he can. Even during cutscenes in this game, Clued is usually stood off screen or invisible somewhere, and it just so happens the loading trigger to enter the Hojo boss fight is to the bottom right of where the game has positioned Clued during this cutscene. Since we can move Clued, we can just make him run straight into the loading trigger. We will be raiding Midgar as normal though, so as not to skip any boss fights. We head underground and there are a few things down here that we will be grabbing, the Aegis Armlet and the Max Ray along with a couple of elixirs. Before long we find ourselves on some underground tracks, and if we head all the way to the very bottom of these tracks, we will find the W item materia. We head right back to the very top and we bump into the Turks. It's possible to avoid this battle if we saved Elena back in Wutai, but we wanted to give it a try. We must battle all three of them at once, and Elena has AoE attacks, which are perfect for ensuring youth gets her limits frequently. We even managed to steal another Zydrich from Rude on our very first attempt. Youth has the cover materia for this one, so she can occasionally take the hits from Reno and Rude, which can help a lot with how often they hit. We use the same setup that we used in the Gelnica to prevent confusion, as even Elena can confuse party members otherwise. We spend every one of Clued's turns trying to steal the tough ring from Reno, and when we finally get it, we focus all attacks on Reno from then on. The reason for this is that we only need to beat one of them to end this fight, and Reno has the least HP at 20. 5,000. Sod is dealing good damage with the curse ring on, and Clued deals just as much damage with his Ultima weapon equipped. Once Reno is beaten, they all run away. Before finding Hojo, we can go to the end of the tracks to emerge back in the front of the Shimra HQ. There's a gift shop inside, and we can stock up on items if we need to. There's even some more weapons to find if we look around all the floors. Once we have everything lying around, we carry on looking for Hojo, only to run into the proud Clod. I genuinely expected this fight to be a decent challenge, but it was an absolute joke. I don't know if I was just really well equipped, or if the Proud Clod was always this pathetic, but this was the easiest boss so far, with the exception of Dine, I suppose. Proud Clod hits frequently enough, but it just couldn't deal any decent damage to us. We had Zydrich's equipped, which reduced elemental damage, so maybe that helped, but even when it used attacks like Wrist Laser, it ended up missing most of the time. There's not much else to say. We were able to play the vast majority of this fight in times 3 speed up, and even when it used beam cannon to deal some actual decent damage, Youth was able to heal it right back up anyway. The most annoying part about this boss fight is the fact that it's a bit of a damage sponge, but after a while it soon goes down, and we earn the Ragnarok. We pick up the missile from the next screen, and now, before we progress any further, we want to make sure that Bort is in our party. There is a weapon called the Missing Score that we can get for Bort just beyond this screen, but it only only spawns there if Bort is in our party. Strange, I know. It also just so happens to be Bort's strongest weapon. The damage it deals is based off the total AP earned on all the materia that we have slotted into its 8 slots. Again though, just like with Ultima Weapon, this does not apply to limits, so we may as well keep this equipped. We swap Sod's setup over to Bort and divide up all the HP plus materia to better balance everyone's max HP, but we made sure that Bort's HP was was higher than Clued's, even if only by a little bit, and we set Bort as the middle party member. We face Hojo and start the fight against his first form, where he just summons a couple of monsters, a floating one and another one on the ground. The monster on the ground will always hit the party member in the middle with a body blow first. Since Bort went into this fight with his limit bar very close to maxed out, it wasn't long before it filled up, and he fired off a catastrophe for a lot of damage. The floating monster can blind its targets with evil poison, but that won't affect us in this run. Like we mentioned
mentioned earlier, limits are not affected by accuracy. It takes a while before we can use another limit, the monsters are pretty weak after all, and Hojo doesn't even attack at this point. Youth will cover a few times, and she can heal the party back to max HP with clear tranquil. The floating monster will only ever use its big fang attack on the target with the highest current HP, and after Youth heals the party, that will most likely either be Youth or Bort with our setup. Even though Bort is on limit level 4, this all helped ensure his limit bar filled up again soon, and a second catastrophe soon followed. This killed the floating monster, but Hojo can just revive the dead monsters immediately. It's Hojo that needs defeating, and that's exactly what happened after a cross slash. Now we must face Hojo's second form, Heretic Hojo. His hands are both targetable now, and as long as both hands are still alive, Hojo can both poison and confuse targets. Clued and Youth have ribbons equipped to prevent both of these, but since Bort has the curse ring equipped for the stat buffs, we couldn't protect him from confusion. We could have used the added effect with the Hades material to prevent confusion, but then Bort would have been killed by the curse ring. This is a big risk, since Bort does get confused early on. If he attacks Hojo with a normal attack whilst confused, that will break our main rule, and we'll have to start the fight over. Thankfully, he only ever attacked his fellow party members, and he even missed them both. Hojo uses a lot of physical attacks in this form, so the party is taking fair damage the whole time, especially on the front row. This results in the party getting a fair few limits in, and Bort was very close to getting his limit for the second time in this form, but his HP was too low to survive another hit. Youth came through though, and she covered Bort twice in a row, and since she was defending, she took even less damage than usual, and then she healed the party just in time for Bort to survive one more hit and get a catastrophe. We are are now on Hojo's third and final form, Life Form Hojo. He can use a lot of status ailments, such as Poison, which he uses on Bort, but he can also use several physical attacks in a row against a single target, and this nearly kills Bort, but thankfully, you've covered some of these attacks and she saves Bort again. You've gets a couple of clear tranquils to top up everyone's HP before Bort's poison can kill him, and he finally gets a catastrophe for about 13,000 damage. It isn't long after when Hojo beats down Bort again, and along with the poison, Bort finally goes down. The combo attacks fill up Clued's limit bar even faster than Bort's, since Clued is still using limit level 1, so we're able to hit a few cross slashes until Hojo finally goes down. Our lowest level character is the only one who didn't get any experience points. How annoying. We are now free to travel anywhere as we prepare for the final battle in Northern Crater. Something interesting we can do. If we equip the W item materia, this allows us to use two items during battle in a single turn. If we select the first item, pick a target for it, then select the second item, instead of picking a target, go back a step, select that same item again, and then go back again. Each time we do this, we are duplicating that item that we're selecting. We can do this over and over until we have 99 of that item. We can even use this to essentially get unlimited gill too by just selling the duplicated items. This is probably a grey area when it comes to the rules though. Even though we're not actually using the items in battle, we're still selecting the W item command, even if we never actually commit to it. If you think this breaks a rule, then just don't use it. You can already duplicate elixirs from the glitch we saw earlier in the game anyway, so it's not like this makes too much of a difference. Next, we need Clued to learn a level 3 limit. To do that, we need him to get a grand total of 320 kills. This is going to be quite the grind. To speed it up, we assign Clued to limit level 2 and we hunt for as many battery cap enemies as we can find in a single battle. It's possible to find 6 at once in the forest outside Rocket Town, and if they hit Clued enough to fill his limit bar, we can take them all out at once with a single blade beam. We can make this process even quicker by lowering Clued max HP by equipping summon materia, which helps him get his limit sooner. We can do this over and over to accumulate kills for Clued. Clued eventually learns his first level 3 limit, Meteor Rain. Where, oh finally! 
but we want his second level 3 limit too, and that means using Meteor Rain six times. Fighting a few Cactors will help with that, and before long we soon learn Finishing Touch. Now we're finally ready to enter the Northern Crater, but there are some specific things we want to do inside the Northern Crater as we travel through. We form a party of Clued, Cat Soup and Vincenzo. We equip them with a weapon and armour that provides them materia slots, and if they have any double or triple AP weapons, we make sure to use those. We fill our materia slots with all the HP plus materias we have, and we make our way down the northern crater, making sure to grab all the items as we go. Soon we arrive at a fork in the road, and we need to choose which characters go which way. We send Tofu to the right, and everyone else to the left. At the second fork, we send Youth, Bort, Sod and Rod upwards, and Clued, Catsoup and Vincenzo downwards. This means there are three paths to the end, and whichever path we send Clued down is the one that we get to explore for ourselves. There's treasure to collect down all three paths and depending on which characters are exploring which paths, that will determine which treasures they find and bring with them when we reunite. On our path, we once again make sure to grab every item on the way and flee every encounter too. When we get to this final room, we do not travel through it. Instead, we turn around and backtrack all the way to the second fork. Now we can take the upper path that we sent Youth Bought Sodden Rod down. If we hadn't backtracked when we did, we wouldn't have been able to enter to this pathway and all the items are still there for us to collect. As we're doing this, if we ever run into these orange ball enemies called movers, then we really want to take the time to kill them. If Clued has his limit at level 3, then a single finishing touch is enough to kill them all. We want to kill them because they reward us with 800 AP each, which is 2400 AP for 3 of them. And since we have triple AP weapons equipped, this means we gain 7200 AP on all materials Area slotted into the triple AP weapons. We have our HP plus materia in there and this is the fastest method of farming AP that I know of. We stayed in this area for a while farming AP to max out those HP plus materias, but then disaster struck. We got pincer attacked by two Aramans. What made this even worse is that along the way Katsup and Vincenzo got inflicted with sadness which slows their limit bars. As usual we take double damage when hit from behind during pincer attacks and these these things can hit quite hard. Dying now would lose us all the AP grinding we've done. Vincenzo falls first, and Clued falls to critically low HP. He gets his limit, but with how low his HP is, he's only going to get one. We use Meteor Rain on one of the Araman, which kills it, and now that one side of enemies is dead, we can flee the battle. Clued died immediately afterwards, but Cat Soup was just able to escape. Anyway, back to what we were doing. At the end of this path, we find the counter material but we must not enter the next door. Instead, we backtrack once more until we reach the first fork in the road, and now we can travel down the last path we've yet to explore, which means we can get all the items in this whole cave ourselves. There is another Mistile Armour here, which is the most important thing on this path. At the end, we once again emerge into the final room, and all the characters reunite. This is the part where the characters would normally give us all the items they found on their own pathway and even though we've already travelled down all three pathways ourselves, due to the specific order we did everything, they still hand over their items to us that they would have found normally. This means that we have just received duplicates of the items they hand over. This includes a duplicate Mistile, although the game spells it Mithril for some reason, a duplicate Imperial Guard, and a duplicate Counter Materia. A Mistile is a piece of armour that gives us a 60% chance to dodge all incoming magic attacks when equipped, and now we have three of them to work with. We can even backtrack all the way to the world map at this point to make any more preparations we may need. We forgot to do it earlier, so now's the time. We fly to the Chocobo Ranch and buy a Mimet Green. Then we fly over to Medeal and feed the Mimet Green to the white Chocobo there. We make sure to tickle it behind the ears and it will give us the Contain Materia. This will be very handy later. Using the AP grinding method that we already used earlier, we grinded enough AP to max out 6 HP plus materials. We also maxed out 3 elemental materials which produced a 4th one, and we also maxed out our added effect materia to produce one more of them. With 6 
mastered HP plus materias, each one boosts a character's max HP by 50%. And since the maximum a character's HP can be boosted by the HP plus materia is 100%, if we equip our three main party members with two each, then that is the highest HP boost they can possibly have. And it saves on a lot more materia slots for other things. We're finally ready to take on the game's finale at the end of the Northern Crater. Here's our setup for the next boss fight. Clued has his Ultima weapon, a Mistyle, and a Ribbon equipped. His Materia setup in his weapon is two mastered HP pluses. The Mistyle armor provides Clued a 60% chance to dodge all magic attacks, and the Ribbon is to prevent poison. We set Clued's limit level to three. Bort has his Max Ray, a Mistyle, and the Curse Ring equipped. His Materia setup in his weapon is two mastered HP pluses. In his armor, we have the added effect combined with Hades to resist poison, and another added effect combined with Destruct Materia to resist instant death. The Mistyle armor is once again to provide Bort a 60% chance to dodge all magic attacks, and the Curse Ring provides a good stat buff overall. You know the deal by now. We also set Bort's limit level to 1. We equip Youth with the Conformer, not the Oritsuru like I did, a Zydrich, and a Ribbon. The Zydrich halves all elemental damage at the cost of no Materia slots. But the only Materia that Youth needs are the two mastered HP plus materials and the cover materia. The ribbon is used to prevent poison. All the empty materia slots we have remaining can be filled with any materia that purely give us stat buffs. For example, Chocobo Law, Death Blow, Luck Plus. They will boost our luck stat. Steel and Double Cut will boost our dexterity, etc. Naturally, all three party members have Fury too. On the way down to the next boss, there are a series of forced encounters. But even though they're forced encounters, we can still run away from them. We can even use these forced encounters to fill up all our limit bars before the boss fight itself. Soon we arrive at the bottom and encounter Genova Synthesis. Genova has three body parts that we can target, the main body and two arms. The main body can use bio to poison us, but we resist poison anyway. What we really need to do is kill the right arm. The reason being is that the body can heal itself, but only if Genova's right arm is alive. Also, if the right arm is alive, it can inflict sadness on its target, and we need to prevent that. So we start the fight with Clued's finishing touch limit to deal over 5,000 damage to all three targets. Following that, Youth hits the right arm with a Grease Lightning to finish it off. Each arm only has 10,000 HP, so we knew those two hits would be enough to kill it. Bort is the only one susceptible to sadness here, but we can't afford for that to happen. Genova can revive her arms, but only if both of them are dead, so we want to keep the left arm alive. This is also why we set Bort's limit level to 1, so he has a single target attack. With the Curse Ring equipped, Bort deals over 8,000 damage to the main body with a big shot. With the left arm still alive, it can still use plenty of physical attacks, which is what we want to fill up our limit bars. But there is a downside to the left arm being alive. It casts stop and ribbons don't prevent that. This means we're likely going to get hit with stop magic several times throughout this battle. But thankfully, it wears off over time. This is time that we'd likely spend just standing there waiting to be attacked anyway, so it's not really a big deal. If youth is stopped, then she can't cover damage until it wears off, so there is a bit of risk involved, but it tends to wear off before it becomes an issue. The upside of Genova casting stop over and over is that it consumes her MP, and after she uses stop approximately 15 times, times, give or take, Genova will run out of MP completely. At this point, all Genova can do is attack physically, which works for us. Youth heals with every limit she gets from here on, and Bort hits the body with Big Shot every chance he gets. We save Clued's limit though, since he only has multi-target limits at level 3 anyway, and we can't risk killing the left arm. Once the body has taken over 45,000 damage, Genova starts a countdown to her own death and her own desperation attack, Ultima. However, if Genova doesn't have any MP left, she cannot cast Ultima at the end of the countdown. So when she hits zero, we are automatically awarded the win. We are given one last chance to access the menu before we fight two bosses back to back. This means whatever setup we go with now, we need to take into account the next two fights. But first, we will mention that some players may experience this fight differently to others. There are a few variables that the game factors in when deciding how this next boss plays out. For example, it's possible 
impossible to face this next boss with multiple parties at the same time. You would need to go through all the awkwardness of swapping back and forth between different parties in order to damage certain body parts in certain orders, etc. Basically, it's much more ideal to fight this boss with a single party. And to make sure that happens, one of the following criteria must be met. Genova Synthesis must have taken 13 or more turns before her countdown, or the lowest level character in the active party is level 34 or lower, or the average party level is 53 or less. The easiest criteria to meet is the first one, as Genova will likely take more than 13 turns in this run anyway, and this ensures a single party encounter against Bizarro Sephiroth. Here's our setup going into this fight. Clued has an elemental materia combined with Shiva, another elemental materia combined with Titan, and a third elemental materia combined with Ramu. The two elemental materias that are combined with Titan and Ramu are both mastered, which means Clued will absorb both lightning and earth magic. But since the elemental materia on Shiva is a new one, it will only half the ice damage. We leave the rest of Clued set up the same. Bort will swap out the curse ring for the tough ring for 50 extra defense and magic defense. This means that Bort can also swap the destruct materia for the contain materia, which when combined with added effect, allows Bort to resist petrify. We also set Bort's limit back to level 3. We leave the rest of Bort set up the same. Youth setup doesn't need to change much at all, as she still reduces all elemental damage by half, and she still has the cover materia too. Since swapping from one limit level to another reduces the limit bar back to zero, Bort starts this battle with no limit bar progress, but Clued's limit was saved from the previous battle, so he has it ready to go. Bizarro Sephiroth has five body parts that we can target, and they all receive a buff for each party member at level 99. Thankfully, none of our party members are that higher level. The five parts are the body, the head, the core, and the two arms. Only the core and the head have turns, but what they do on those turns depends on which body part are alive at the time. If the core is alive, then Bizarro will heal itself frequently for over 6,000 damage a time. And if the arms are alive, then it will use strong fire, ice, lightning, and earth damage. This is why our setup protects us against elements as best we can. We saved Clued's limit on purpose until the time is right. Bizarro uses stigma on the whole party. This inflicts both poison and slow, as well as damage. But we resist poison, and in this fight, slow isn't that big a deal. The missiles we have equipped also somehow allow us to dodge the attack altogether. We need to bide our time until Bort gets his limit. Youth keeps us all healed in the meantime, and sometimes Bizarro will even heal us with an elemental attack that we absorb. After three stigmas and a fire three attack, Bort finally gets his limit. But now, we need to wait until Youth gets her limit as well. In the wait for Youth's limit, thankfully, Bizarro ended up healing various party members with his magic attacks. Here is why we need all three of our limits at once. The way to win this fight is to kill the body, but the body has 40,000 HP and the core heals the body every turn for 6,000 HP. The core has 10,000 HP but cannot be damaged until both arms have been killed, and the arms have 4,000 HP each. So we would need to destroy both arms, then the core, then the body. With all three limits queued up, we can first use Clued's finishing touch to damage all body parts at once. This deals just enough damage to destroy both arms and the head, and I mean only just. With both arms destroyed, the core is vulnerable, and the next limit we've queued up is Bort's Anger Max. With only the body and the core alive, all damage from the Anger Max is spread across both of those targets. Following that, we have Youth's Grease Lightning queued up on the core, and between between Bort and Youth, they dealt over 10,000 damage to destroy the core. Now Bizarro will no longer be able to heal itself. The body can revive the arms and the head, but it can't revive the core. This is the part where the fight gets dangerous. If the head is defeated, then there's a chance that Bizarro will use a move called Aurora Fence. If we ever see this move, this attempt is dead, and that is because Aurora Fence targets all three party members and it removes their fury. 
There is no way to protect against this. Even if we went on to win this fight, not having Fury for the next fight is a deal breaker. If we're lucky, Bizarro will revive the head before it can cast Aurora Fence. However, if the head is revived and the core is defeated, then Bizarro has access to another new move called Heartless Angel. This attack reduces all party members down to 1 HP. This sounds bad, but actually, this is exactly what we want. As long as our party members' HP is aren't too low when it uses Heartless Angel, this gives everyone their limits immediately. So we queue up all three limits again. Youth heals first, Clued uses Meteor Rain, and Bort uses Anger Max. Since Bizarro hasn't revived the arms yet, the only targets are the head and the body. Meteor Rain kills the head easily, which means the body takes all 18 hits from Anger Max. This wasn't enough to finish it off, but we knew we were close. Another Heartless Angel, and the whole party went right back down to one HP. This gave Youth her limit, but not Clued or Bored, since they're both on level 3 limits, but at least we're able to heal. I'm sure you can see the routine though. With every two Heartless Angels we get hit by, our limit bars all fill up, and then we queue all three limits. We make sure Youth heals first every time, and after a few Meteor Rains and Anger Maxes, Bizarro Sephiroth goes down. There's no break between that fight and the next one though. We're thrust straight into a battle with Safer Sephiroth. Considering this is the final boss, his pattern is surprisingly predictable. He starts things off with Wall to boost his defense temporarily, and then he uses Shadow Flare on a random party member. He chose Bort, and it very nearly killed him. He follows up with a physical attack, which also inflicts paralysis and darkness. But luckily, he hit Youth with this and not Bort. Youth's ribbon protects her from both status ailments. Sephiroth then raises into the air and uses Pale Horse on a random target. Once again, we got lucky and he targeted Youth. The reason this is lucky is because not only does Pale Horse inflict damage, but it also inflicts sadness. Once again, Youth's ribbon protects her from that. Youth didn't quite take enough damage to fill her limit bar though, so we can't heal yet, but Sephiroth always follows Pale Horse with Supernova. This attack reduces all party members' current HP to 1 16th. So Supernova can never actually kill us. It also inflicts confusion, silence, and slow, but ribbons protect Clued and Youth from these, and the added effect combined with Hades' materia protects Bort from confusion as well. After a very long animation, the whole party is very weak, but we were ready with Youth's turn so we could heal as quickly as possible. After all, Sephiroth's next turn can come around sooner than you think. With all the status ailment protection we have, Supernova actually ends up helping us to boost our limit bars, Sephiroth follows Supernova with Break, which deals decent earth damage and petrifies the target. All party members resist Petrify thanks to the ribbons and the added effect combined with Contain Materia. Told you that Materia would come in handy. Youth is his target once again, but her Zydrich reduces the damage by half. Sephiroth lowers back down and uses Dispel on all targets to remove any buffs we might have, which we don't. He then uses Dean to deal about a thousand damage to all targets, which allows Youth to heal once more. Clued then takes a physical attack, which allows us to hit back for the first time. Clued's Meteor Rain dealt over 27,000 damage. We have now seen almost all of Sephiroth's attacks. He uses Pale Horse again on Bort to fill his limit bar, but Bort is the only party member not resisting Sadness. Since Bort already had Fury, the Fury and the Sadness end up cancelling each other out, and Bort's status is returned to neutral. Bort still gets an Anger Max in though, and it dealt over 18,000 damage. Sephiroth has just over 30,000 HP remaining. As expected, Sephiroth follows Pale Horse with Supernova, so another heal for us. And then Clued is hit with Break, but Clued absorbs Earth damage thanks to the Titan Materia being combined with a Mastered Elemental Materia. Sephiroth uses Wall on himself and Shadow Flare on Bort, but thanks to the Mistile, Bort dodges the Shadow Flare. Clued takes a heavy hit, and he hits back with another Meteor Rain, but unfortunately we only dealt about 14,000 damage thanks to the wall that Sephiroth put up. This means that Sephiroth has just 
under a quarter of his HP remaining, but this also means that Sephiroth changes things up a little bit. Instead of using Break after Supernova, he uses Heartless Angel now. First, he hits Youth with Pale Horse, and then he uses Supernova as usual. Youth heals up, and Bort was so close to getting his limit. If he hadn't lost Fury, he would have gotten it. And then this is when he pulls out the Heartless Angel, to reduce us all to 1 HP. But would you believe, Bort dodged it. Clue didn't know, and that's one more Meteor Rain at full power this time, and Safer Sephiroth goes down. All that's left now is the final battle. Clude goes one-on-one -on -one with Sephiroth. No allies to help us, no method of healing, our limit bar slowly filling automatically. It fills up right when we get our turn, and the only option we have access to is Clude's level 4 limit, Omni Slash. How convenient that our only option in the final battle of the whole game still follows our main rule. And with that, we have finally beaten the game. But we're not done yet, are we? I know what you're thinking. What about the super bosses? Well, let's give them a try too. We have some preparations to make first. A lot of preparations to make first. We return to the overworld and fly over to the Chocobo Ranch. Our goal is to get at least a green chocobo, and we can do this without any chocobo racing, thank goodness. We talk to the owner in the left building to rent stables. The maximum we need for a green chocobo is four stables, but we decided to buy all six, just in case. Next, we enter the stables to buy a few things from Chocobilly. We need at least 51 cracker greens and one Sorara nut. We also need two carob nuts, but we can't buy these. Instead, we fly over to the ice area and look for a random encounter in the grassy parts. We're looking for a monster called Vlacorados, and when we find one, we can steal a carob nut from it, and then we run away and do it again for a second carob nut. Now for the more time-consuming part. We need to catch two specific chocobos. Before doing this, we make sure to have at least four empty stables back at the ranch. Make sure to equip the choco law materia. The first chocobo we're looking for can be found on the footprints close to the Icicle Inn, but it has to be the chocobo that is encountered along with either one or two rabbit enemies. If there is a wolf enemy in the encounter, that's no good, so keep looking. We make sure to have our limits ready before the encounter, so we can eliminate the monsters quickly before the chocobo had a chance to flee. Once we have that chocobo, dismount it and send it back to the stables. Next, fly over to the area outside Medeal. There are more footprints outside, and here we need to find a chocobo that comes with two spiral enemies. Spirals are these horned things in shells. This took us a fair while to find, so the three times speed up came in really handy again. Once again, we had our limits ready and we took out the spirals to catch the chocobo. We dismount it and send it to the stables again, and then we fly back there. We stand just outside the ranch, getting as close to it as possible without actually entering it. We save the game here and hard reset the game. We load that latest save again and run directly into the ranch as soon as possible. Talk to Choco Billy and select moving chocobos. We must now choose one of our two chocobos to put in a stable. With the specific chocobos we caught, we are guaranteed to have one great chocobo and one wonderful chocobo. Choose the great one first, and it should be revealed as a female chocobo at this point. Next, select moving chocobos again and move the wonderful chocobo. This will put it in a stable and reveal it to be male. Next, we must leave the ranch, stand close to the ranch again, and save our game again. Just like before, we hard reset, reload the save and run into the ranch again as fast as possible. We enter the stable and tell Choco Billy that we want to feed a chocobo. Select the cracker greens and then choose any chocobo, it doesn't matter which. Just make sure to only feed them one single cracker green. Now, without leaving the stable, talk to Billy again and choose to mate the chocobos. He wants us to walk over to the two that we want to mate. Make sure to choose the great female chocobo first and then choose the wonderful male chocobo second. When asked which nut we want to use, we select the carob nut that we stole earlier. If we have done everything right, we should end up with a blue female chocobo offspring. Next, we leave the ranch and find six random encounters outside. We don't need to win these encounters, so we can just run away from all of them. After that, we need to do the whole save the game close to the ranch, hard reset, reload, and run back inside quickly again. This time, we need to feed any chocobo exactly 50 cracker greens. And then, without leaving the stable, we mate the same two chocobos as 
last time. Once again, we make sure to choose the great female chocobo first and choose the wonderful male chocobo second. We use our remaining carob nut and if we've done it all right, we end up with a green male chocobo. Now we can ask Billy if we can ride one of our chocobos. We enter the airship with the chocobo and fly over to the Wutai area outside of town and then use the green chocobo to scale the mountains to find a cave. In this cave, we find the mime materia and it's the only mime materia in the whole game. We do need more of them though. The only way to get more of them is to master our current one and to do that we need to earn 100,000 AP. Remember the AP farming we did in Northern Crater against the movers? Well we're going back there to grind out a whole bunch more AP. We equip a couple of triple AP weapons, Clued and Sod have one each, and we slot both our counter materials and the mine materia into them. We spend an ungodly amount of time grinding AP to master all three of those materia. As soon as we master one, we swap it for the new one that it creates, and then we master that one all over again. We do this until we have eight mastered counter materias and eight mastered mine materias. Although the eighth mine materia doesn't need to be mastered all the way, thankfully. The mine materia provides a character with the mime command, and choosing this command in battle will make that character repeat the most recent action of any party member, even if our previous action was a limit. Although, the act of selecting the mime command still breaks our main rule. However, when a mime materia is paired with a mastered counter materia, when that character is attacked, they will automatically counter with that paired mime materia. So, if we use a limit, then get hit, we can counter automatically with that same limit again. This might be flirting with a rule break, but as we're not directly selecting any command other than a limit, I think we can allow this. Plus, we're going to need this if we want to stand any chance against the super bosses. So here's what the setup looks like. We equip a character with a weapon and armor that provides four pairs of materia slots each. For Clued, that would be his ultima weapon and a wizard's bracelet. Then we fill all eight of those pairs with a mastered counter materia combined with a mime materia. Just like we said, if we enter a battle, use a limit and then get hit, we will counter with that same limit again. But since we have counter paired with mime eight times, we will actually counter with that limit eight times in a row. We know that we need more damage, so it's time to get Clued's level four limit, Omni Slash. We use this against Sephiroth in the final battle, but to actually unlock it for use outside of that battle, we need to earn 32,000 battle points at the battle square in Gold Saucer. We need to spend GP just to participate in the battle square, but there is an NPC at the entrance of Gold Saucer who exchanges GP for Gil. He only has a 15% chance of spawning, but as long as we've purchased a lifetime pass to Gold Saucer for 30,000 Gil, we can just run in and out of the main entrance over and over until the NPC spawns. Every time he does spawn, we can get 100 GP from him at maximum, so if we do this for long enough, we can get several hundred GP quite easily. We have more than enough Gil to afford all of this following our grind in Northern Crater after all, not to mention we can just sell some mastered materia for stupid amounts of money. Only one character can enter the battle square, and we choose Clued. There are eight fights in a row, each one directly following from the last. After each fight that we win, there is a slot reel that we must stop. Most of the time, this will give us a random handicap for the rest of the eight fights, which means the arena gets more difficult the further we go. Clued has a level three limit ready to go and eight pairs of counter mine materia. We use Meteor Range straight away, and now each time Clued gets hit, he counters with eight more Meteor Rains, which is more than enough to defeat anything the Battle Square can throw at us. Clued will stop countering once the current round is won, but as soon as he gets hit again at the beginning of the next round, the Meteor Rain spam starts all over again. This new powerful weapon for Clued has a gimmick. The closer Clued is to having full HP, the more damage it does. This would normally be a risk reward, however, limits are exempt from this rule, so there is literally no downside to keeping this weapon equipped. The only issues we faced is that there are some enemies in the battle square that will only ever counter attack. We found three enemies like this, the Adamantai Mai, the Kual, and the Tonberry. If we encounter any of these enemies, and only these enemies, in any given round, we cannot win those encounters. At that point, our only option is to flee the encounter and sacrifice the BP gained in the run so far. Since whichever monster we encounter on each round is RNG, there's still
still a decent chance that we won't run into any of those three at all. As for the handicaps, the more dire the handicap we get, the more BP we earn at the end. However, if we land on a handicap that causes a status effect, like poison, as long as we have a ribbon equipped, Clued will be completely unaffected, basically giving us no handicap. The only handicaps we don't want to land on are all blue materia break, all yellow materia break, all materia break, and no limits. Any of these would prevent our strategy from working entirely. If we want to maximize our BP after the 8 rounds, there are certain handicaps that we can get directly before the final round that will ensure a big payout at the end if we can win. The best one for us is the all green materia break. If we can land on that as our last handicap, we can earn between 9,000 and over 10,000 BP a time. We can even manipulate the slots to help guarantee that we land on any given handicap that we want. If we hold down the square button while the slots are on screen, this hides them from view. Even though the slot reel is still making noise in the background, the slot reel is actually paused in place. If we release the square button and then hit X directly afterwards, we will always land on the very next handicap in the reel. What's more, whenever we win 8 rounds and we're back outside the arena, the game reverts Clued's HP, MP and his limit bar back to what they were before we entered the arena. This is very convenient, since we're not allowed to leave the battle square without forfeiting any unspent BP. Once we have earned 32,000 BP, we can purchase the Omni Slash limit, and our work here is done. This brings us to the first of the two super bosses, Emerald Weapon. Clued has limit level 4, with Omni Slash ready to go. We make sure our party is fully healed, and we encounter Emerald. As this battle takes place underwater, we have a 20 minute time limit, but that won't be an issue. Emerald uses Emerald Shoot right away, and we can't afford to let Clued get hit by this. Thankfully, he targets Youth, and Clued can get an Omni Slash on his first turn. Omni Slash hits 15 times, and every hit is an automatic critical hit. Although, I feel like I need to give you all a flashing lights warning. Critical hits in this game cause a white flash on the screen, so 15 of them in quick succession is bound to strain the eyes a little bit, especially with times 3 speed turned on. We deal around 5,500 damage per hit, and with 15 hits, that is over 80,000 damage. Emerald followed this up with a stomp attack to all party members, and it seems the damage from this is divided between the surviving party members. This ensured that Clued survived the hit quite easily, and now his counter-attack spamming can begin. Clued will hit 8 more Omni Slashes in a row, for a grand total of over 600,000 damage. This would have been enough to kill almost any other boss in the whole game. But Emerald has a million HP. It was at this point that we learned that Mime doesn't repeat the last action that Clued takes, it repeats the last action that any of our party members take. We made the mistake of having Sod use Boost Jump, and now Clued was trying to mime Sod's Boost Jump, which of course he can't. Basically, the strategy to win this fight is to hit our first Omni Slash with Clued, and then put the controller down and let RNG take its course. As long as Clued can survive two hits from Emerald, he will counter twice, with 8 Omni Slashes each time, for well over a million damage. It's a good thing too, because Emerald Weapon has an attack called Air Tam, that deals 1111 damage to all party members for each piece of materia they have equipped. Considering Clued has 16 pieces of materia equipped, it would easily one-shot him an Emerald Weapon is defeated, and in only about 5 minutes. Now, for the final super boss, Ruby Weapon. The unique gimmick with this boss is that if you enter the battle with more than one party member alive, Ruby will completely eliminate two party members at random right as the battle starts. Usually, we can get around this by knocking two party members out before the battle, entering the battle, and then reviving them both. But since no limits in this game can revive party members, that doesn't help us. We need to enter this battle with only Clued being conscious, to remove the risk of Ruby removing Clued from the fight. Ruby will now spawn two tentacles into the fight to make this essentially a pincer attack. The strategy is exactly the same as Emerald. Use Omni Slash on Ruby and hope to survive a few hits so we can counter attack with eight Omni Slashes each time. However, each hit from Omni Slash deals around 540 damage. This is due to Ruby Weapon having an absurd high defense stat. 
with 15 hits that is just over 8,000 damage with a single Omni Slash. That sounds good, but Ruby Weapon has 800,000 HP. If we take a hit, we will counter 8 times for a total of about 65,000 damage. So this would mean that we need to survive and counter 12 or 13 hits from Ruby and its tentacles. This sounds impossible, but let's look at what Ruby's attacks actually are. One of his tentacles deals a percentage of HP damage, and the other other one does the same percentage of MP damage. Getting hit by these is much more preferable than getting hit by Ruby itself because at least these attacks can never kill Clued, and he still counterattacks these and aims his counterattack at Ruby. Ruby's attacks are limited if his tentacles are in the sand. It only has four. Ruby Flame for fire damage, Ruby Ray for non-elemental damage that also inflicts confusion, Ultima for powerful AoE magic damage, and his strongest attack, Shadow Flare, for extreme extremely powerful magic damage to a single target. Ruby and the tentacles also inflict several different status ailments with each attack, but with a ribbon on we don't need to worry about those. So, with these powerful attacks dealing thousands of damage each, there's no way Clued could survive 12 or 13 hits. However, if we replace one of our counter mime combinations with a mastered elemental materia combined with ifrit materia, Clued will now absorb fire damage. This means we will only counter with 7 omni slashes instead of 8, but it does provide us with more survivability since there's a chance that Ruby will heal us with Ruby Flame. Although the reduced damage we deal now means that we need to survive and counter 14 to 15 hits instead. Nonetheless, this is our best shot at winning this fight. One more thing we can do to prepare is to use a tranquilizer on Clued to inflict him with sadness. Remember back in the apps fight, we said that sadness reduces all damage by 30%, but also causes our limit bars to fill at half their normal rate? Well, since we're going into the ruby fight with our limit bar already pre-filled, and then we're relying on counters for the rest of the fight, we don't need to fill our limit bar up again during the battle, so we may as well have sadness to reduce any damage we take at this point. Unfortunately, we enter the fight and a tentacle got their turn first. It dealt heavy HP damage. Clue tried to counter this eight times, but since we haven't taken a turn yet, he had nothing to mine. We used our Omni Slash on our first actual turn, and now we may as well just put the controller down, as it's all up to RNG from here. The first Omni Slash dealt about 8,000 damage, and then we get hit by the other tentacle for MP damage. Normally, Clued would have countered that, but Ruby counters the first hit he receives with a random tentacle attack, and we can't counter a counter, and then we get hit with Ruby Ray for almost 2,000 damage. This prompts our first counter cycle of 7 Omni Slashes, that's a total of 8 Omni Slashes so far, for around about 66,000 damage. Ruby then heals us to over 5,000 HP with Ruby Flame, but then followed it up with another Ruby Ray right afterwards. Every counter cycle from here on will result in around about 56,000 more damage. So the second counter cycle puts the total damage on about 123,000. We're healed again by another Ruby Flame, and then the tentacle drops our HP back down again. A third counter cycle takes our damage total to about 181,000. A Ruby Ray drops our HP to under 1,000, and a fourth counter cycle takes our total damage to 239,000. We're hit by a tentacle again for HP damage, but the tentacle can only deal percentage damage, so they can never kill us. A fifth counter cycle puts our total damage on 297,000. Having HP this low is dangerous as any of Ruby's attacks can one-shot us, but as luck would have it, he used Ruby Flame and then Ruby Ray back to back. The former helps us survive the latter, and we got a sixth counter cycle for a total of 354,000 damage so far. And then we got even luckier, and Ruby used Ruby Flame twice in a row. We took some MP damage and then hit the seventh counter cycle to put our total damage dealt on 412,000. We're halfway there. We took another hit for MP damage and then hit an 8th counter cycle for 470,000 damage. A Ruby Ray dropped our HP a bit, but a 9th counter cycle put our damage on 528,000. Another Ruby Ray puts us back in critical HP and we followed it up with a 10th counter cycle. Our total damage is now 585,000. Our luck continues. We get healed by Ruby Flame and then hit for more MP damage. An 11th counter cycle puts our total damage on 643,000. A Ruby Ray puts us back to low HP again. A 12th counter cycle sees our damage go to 701,000. 
and again, we get healed by Ruby Flame. We counter another HP attack from the tentacle, and the 13th counter cycle puts our total damage on 759,000. And then... Holy miscount. The damage calculations we were doing were lowballing the potential result since we were rounding down. I guess we must have just gotten a good number of high rolls to kill Ruby in just 13 counter cycles. Considering Ruby could have killed us at any point with either an ultimate or a shadow flare, RN Jesus was most certainly looking down on us for this fight. We have done it! Can you beat Final Fantasy VII with only limits? Well, not quite. We still had to use healing items when up against the game's first boss, the Guard Scorpion. If only there was a way we could go back and fight it again. Oh wait, there is. I'll preference this by saying that what you're about to see is only possible on the Steam version of the game. As we've been making our way through the game, we need to have made a couple of backup saves at certain points. The first backup save that we need to have made and kept is directly after defeating the Guard Scorpion. The second save can be any time after that as long as we're still on Disc 1, the closer to the end of Disc 1, the better. Now, with Ruby defeated, we need to re reload the save close to the end of disc 1. We travel to the Junon area if we're not already there. We set both Clued and Bort to their strongest limit levels, and we fill up both of their limit bars if they're not already. Now, we can save the game again and overwrite this save file. Next, still on this save file, we get into a battle and kill off the two characters that are alongside Clued. After the battle, we swap both the dead party members out and then get into another battle. But this time, have Clued get killed off. After that battle, swap the two other dead characters back in so that we have a full team of three dead characters. Yes, the game lets you do this for some reason. If we were to enter a battle now, we would game over immediately. So without moving, we need to save the game now on a separate save file. Next, we exit the game and reload the first backup save file that we made directly after the Guard Scorpion. We then need to get into a random encounter counter, and then we need to lose that fight to get a game over. At this point in the game there is a countdown timer in the top left and dying to a battle now will store that countdown timer in the game's memory. Now we reload the save file with the three dead party members and get into a battle right away, but it has to be a specific encounter made up of two Neurosufroths and one formula. We can still see the stored timer in the top left, which has defaulted to all zeros. The game sees this as us running out of time, but since all three party members are dead, the game over from that will happen first. This stores the current battle ID in the game's memory, which is why it had to be that specific encounter. Now, we reload the file that has both Clued and Bort's limit bars filled up, and then we get into an encounter on the world map. The timer is still in the corner, and this time, the game will see this as us running out of time, but due to the battle ID that we stored, we don't get a game over. Instead, the game warps us back to the reactor after Guard Scorpion. From here, we use this save point and save the game in yet another separate save file. Then we reload the game and load this latest save file. Due to what we've been doing, this actually loads us into the debug room. If we walk straight up, we find several NPCs. We talk to Sod and select the top option on the list. This will start the game from the beginning by replaying the game's opening. As soon as we gain control of Clued, we can see that all our stats, level, equipment, and even limits have all all carried over. Now we play the game's beginning as normal. Clued faces the same two guards at the start, and this is why we filled up Clued's limit bar way ahead of time. The early game enemies would never have been able to fill up our limit bars with their low damage output and our much higher HP total. We can one-shot both of these guards with a single limit that hits all targets, like Blade Beam or Meteor Rain. We flee all encounters on our way up to the reactor, and we enter the boss fight against the Guard Scorpion. This is why we filled up Bort's limit bar first as well. At the level Bort is on, he can one-shot the Guard Scorpion 
him with pretty much any limit he has available. We have finally done it! Can you beat Final Fantasy VII with only limits? In a weird roundabout way, yes, you can. For every fight, with the exception of the very first encounter against the Guard Scorpion. Our workaround may have been interesting, but it was hardly legitimate. If anyone knows any method of killing the Guard Scorpion the first time around in a pure limits only run, then please let me know. If you're still listening to my voice right now, then thank you very much for sticking it out for this long. And if you've already subscribed, then thank you for that as well. You can follow our Twitch and join our Discord servers as well. We're all friends there. Speaking of friends, I have a few people I need to thank. First of which is Death Unites Us from 48 Productions for answering my questions and providing me with the Steam footage. Then of course there's all the people who have supported us. On Patreon we have a Lazy Dragon LED23 Stephen Foot and Tor, and our YouTube members Codename Lance, Drew, Fist the Knightly, Floop, Griffy, Jack Scott, JP, Rocket Plot, The Great Michelle, Vivius Vicious, and William Zingleman. And our Twitch subs, a Lazy Dragon, Atomic Nightmare 42, Evolve Pixel, Finn Living with a Ghost, Hakey Joey 40, Ham Scoffer, Henneman One, Jesus Christ 00 AD, Jin H0505, John Fitz49, Cami7, Melphilis, Miss Barbs, Quisicottle DB, Spectrum Z90, 10 divided by 6, That Chloe is of the Jammy Emperor, The Only Intruder, Tauster, True DK0, and Vital Daffodil. Thank you all so much. If you haven't seen our other Final Fantasy challenge runs, then there is a playlist linked on screen right now. Or if you want to see a different kind of challenge run, like Metal Gear Solid without taking any steps, I will link that playlist on here too. I have been talking for far too long.